Good morning and good evening to all. So welcome to the module 5A uh, for the future of smart and inclusive cities. To officially start our program this afternoon, I would like to call on the Senior Director for Policies and Programs of the Asia Pacific Rim Universities, Ms. Christina Sean Lever. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Can I just check? Yes, brilliant. Right, my dear honorable mayors and dear colleagues, so I'm Christina Schoenlieber, as you just heard from Jennifer. I'm from the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, from which many of the wonderful module leaders and experts that have led and contributed, that have modules and contributed to this Mayor's Academy um, over the last few months, and are also leading this module five a part of. And as such, I very, very warmly welcome you to the kickoff session of module five today. So this module will focus on smart and inclusive cities, and it will provide an opportunity to take insights that you may have gathered from the previous modules and link the key aspects of these, such as, for example, urban resilience and environmental challenges that we heard about in module four with opportunities that new te technological innovations and developments can offer in order to address these and as well as other challenges, urban challenges, urbanization challenges even. So during today's and next session, you will see that as part of this, it is really important to not only consider technological aspects, but to explore how technology can be deployed in the best way and what data can be analyzed to address the challenges of, of urbanization, such as traffic congestions, air pollution, waste collection, water shortages, floodings, as well as social services. So a key point is also to define a common understanding what the key aspects of city planning and development should be that are, that are of the trans, that should be transformed through smart city initiatives. Development of suitable governance frameworks and policies that should go hand in hand in applying or in planning for these and applying these. This is equally important to work out upfront how these are implemented and deployed in order to, for suitable regulated smart cities systems to be applied for the good of the citizens. Another dimension is to understand the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement to ensure the right technologies and smart solutions are applied to the right contexts and suitable scale to deliver the enhanced services and suitable solutions in a sustainable way. Within this context, the environment within which your cities are established and the people within these are key focus and factors that we need to be aware of. And these are really important aspects. And in addition to the technology, to the actual technology that should be deployed. So with this, we can ensure that smart solutions enable cities to be more inclusive, people-centered, and ultimately help your cities to be more sustainable. This is what we're all here for. Also, it is highly likely that digital readiness levels across your cities will vary considerably. This also means that applications of smart technologies will equally vary in terms of focus, scale, and form across your cities and across the solutions that you're looking for. So thus, I'd say the aim of today's and next week's session is to provide you with a multi multiple and many real world case studies set within different contexts to illustrate how smart technologies have been applied across these, across varying contexts within the region. And I do hope that this will help you to translate the ones that are most relevant and pertinent to your own cities and to the challenges that you're looking to address. So to this regard, um, we have a great set of expert speakers specifically for you today, supporting this model from the Philippines, from New Zealand, the USA, as well as UNASCAP, ICLE and the UN Capital Development Fund. And I hope you will be able to engage with each other and our experts today to again in a fruitful and very insightful discussions. So thank you all for being here today and I'd like to hand back over to Jennifer and all the colleagues to kickstart the sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for welcoming us all here in the module five. Okay. Okay. 
The next is the module rationale and objective. So for module 5A, we will focus on smart city initiatives, plans and policies, and focus on local communities and residents to respond to their needs instead of just focusing on technological advancement and economic growth. To integrate digital and technological inclusion targets into smart city initiatives, plans, policies, and cities, identify the vulnerable groups who potentially can be excluded or overlooked in smart city plans and policies, and create and strengthen partnership to bring more attention and resources to long-term urban digital inclusion strategies that break silos between international, national, state, and local actors. So this module is divided into two parts. So today we have module 5A. So we will be joined by uh, the module coordinators. We have here Dr. Ann Talton, Associate Professor, Urban Studies in the University of Washington, Tacoma. Hi, Dr. Ann. Uh, of course, myself, uh, Dr. Jennifer Marie Amparo from the College of Human Ecology, UP Los Banos. And we will be joined by Assistant Professor of the College of Human Ecology, UP Los Banos as well, Dr. Edgar Reyes. So the facilitators for this afternoon are our colleagues an alumni of the college as well, from Eclay, Southeast Asia, Ms. Anne Dominic Ortiz, and Kenneth Bernard Edon from Eclay, Southeast Asia. Say hi, Anne, Anna, and Kenneth, and Dr. Hello, Edon. everyone. Hello. Hello. Great to see you all. All right, thank you very much. And our, of course, our respected speakers for this afternoon will be from the private sector, also from international development organizations. Uh, later on, we'll introduce to you uh, each of them. We have from Smart Cities Council ANZ, we have Janat Makbul, we have from Stratcom, Colleen Stilly, from UNSCAP, Matthew Perkins, and Paul Martin from UNCDF. All right, so to start the ball rolling, I would like, uh, I would like to call our first speaker who will discuss to us the basic concept of future smart cities. He's also the chair of the Department of Community Environmental Resource Planning at the College of Human Ecology. To discuss smart city from fiction to reality and key policy pathways, I'd like to call on Dr. Edgar M. Reyes, Jr. Hi, good day, everyone. Uh, can I share my screen, Mom Jen? Uh, I, I did some few changes in my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, let me just check. Am I audible to everyone? Stop it, guys. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, I'll wait. I think it's on uh, sharing mode already. Okay, so again, uh, good day to everyone. I am uh, an urban planner. Uh, and practitioner in the Philippines and also an assistant professor. And uh, I'll be providing an overview of what smart cities are and uh, from the story of being a fiction now to a reality and some key policy pathways, especially related to the Asia Pacific region. So just to give a short overview of uh, the project for today, I'll be providing a brief urbanization milestone we're in which uh, the city concept actually emanated, then cities in our history, just to uh, provide how cities are being termed through time until it became uh, what we will be discussing about the smart city. And the concept of smart city in terms of definitions and in terms of uh, the things that we need to realize or we need to like think about when we talk about smart city and policy pathways on the city. So, Let's start. Okay, so in relation to the history of uh, human, human beings, we see a lot of uh, changes in our with this and then the ancient times down to our contemporary um, uh, Here are some of the uh, issues and concern that is relevant when we talk about today. So from the rise of the ancient cities to the 18th century, 
tradition, the 19th century early concepts on global urbanization, the different United Nations uh, conferences, such as the Habitat One, the urban problems at the national and regional concern, going to the 90s, diversity was uh, really highlighted to 1996, where in which the second uh, habitat was uh, conducted, highlighting the notions of urban poverty, which, which came to be the problems of major cities uh, across the world during the 90s, up to the 2000s for the Millennium Development Goal. So we have around eight uh, MDGs. And then 2001, where in which cities are seen as catalysts for social uh, economic integration, then urban slum problems, housing and financing problems, urban safety and security, then planning for sustainable cities during the 2009, and then during the 2010, uh, up to now, we have the cities and climate change as among the pressing issue, 2013, sustainable urban mobility, 2015, we have the SDGs, just to give you the whole spectrum of how we try to disentangle the issue of cities and uh, urban places uh, globally. And 2016, we have the third uh, conference or the Habitat 3, um, putting forward cities as the main um, catalyst for development globally. So it's not the country perspective, but every city's perspective to uh, do urbanization and to uh, do sustainable development. So that's how the urbanization actually is in terms of the milestones. And some fact check related to that, cities and urban places actually evolve as a response to the pertinent human ecological dynamics happening through time. As we can see here in this diagram, we can see the different issues and concern that might be a problem before, resurfacing now, and um, will be uh, the same issues and concerns that smart city movement will be dealing uh, now and even in the future. So now let's have a glimpse of how cities in our history came to be. So around 18th century, aside from the ancient cities before, we have the concept of industrial city. This is brought about by the uh, urbanization process and industrialization, where in which uh, the general form of the environment is uh, with uh, confrontations related to the problem of pollution and, um, and destruction of the environment. So a lot of industrial cities uh, started in the Europe, then the Americas, and then it went down to the uh, developing countries. And then around 1950s to 1940s, we have the different change, the perspective to look at cities, such as the parks movement, movement city beautiful movement, the new communities movement, uh, the regional cities, no? radiant city and contemporary city. So some of the best examples during that time was Paris. And then we have the 1960s and to the 1980s, uh, we have the concepts because of the different problems. They manage the different issues and concern. We have the concept of healthy cities, the eco city theory, and the sustainable city. So as you can see, around the 1960s and the 1980s, the concept of sustainability actually started. But it was only during the 90s when the actual concept of a green city, eco city, digital city, and even smart city started. Because you will be looking at uh, the previous slide during the 90s is when the Earth Summit actually started, where in which the biodiversity concern actually uh, emanated as among the pressing issues. And uh, that's the reason for the green city. And then we have the and smart city to provide contextualization. Smart city actually started in terms of the concept during the 1990s, but it was more of the a notion of what a digital city is all about. When we talk about digital city and the technology and modernization of a certain area, for example, a city. So trying to navigate uh, from the normal manual uh, data collection procedure into a more modernized version of it. So that's how they, they started uh, the concept of digital city and then smart city. Then 
Around the 2000s, with the advent of the climate change, disaster risk uh, reduction, resilient city uh, came to be as a more in thing when we try to uh, input it at the city escape level. And then during the 2010, to marry how we really uh, would want this entangle these issues related to climate, the issues related to the different problems of the city, came the smart city movement. So this is when the different uh, models came to be, the different uh, indicators for us to measure really smart cities. So some uh, information related to that. Smart city was first used during the 1990s and its definition and details were given emphasis only during the 2010. So let's put some definitions to the smart city. So these are some laymanized definition for smart city. Cities that engage in a more effort to plan and implement policies on renewable energy, climate protection, public transit, waste reduction, water conservation, protection of environmentally sensitive land, green building, et cetera. So if you can see with the definition of smart city here, it is not emphasizing on the different technology or trying to modernize a certain area for it to become smart, but really focusing on the different issues and concern that every city or urban place is actually having problem of. And then the technology that you're going to utilize to address this issue are just enablers for you to be able to achieve a better city, which is, they say, a smart city. Other definition, when you try to make it smart and climate resilient city, they focus, of course, on uh, climate resiliency and uh, inclusive cities built collaboratively. So take note of the term collaboratively because partnerships is a very uh, big uh, chunk when we talk about a smart city movement that use different types of technology and data in order to achieve better quality of life for all of its residents. So for all of its residents, connoting inclusivity. So those are some of the key value that smart city would want to emphasize. So definitions vary, but the intentions are the same for smart city. There is sort of emphasis on technology and data as an enabler for smart city movement to work. Okay. When we say it's smart, we define it to qualify sustainability projects and actions in an urban space. And when we say we want to be smarter as a smart city, we focus more on the sustainable efficient and equitable and livable uh, factors that is related to a uh, city condition. Then when we say smart and sustainable, it focuses on the notion of innovativity, okay, the innovativeness of every city. So that tries to use ICT or uh, our information communication and technology and other means to improve the quality of life, efficiency of urban operations and services. So as you can see, it is focusing on the innovativeness and using the ICT, the technology, the data, the big data, the information that we have for us to build you know, a better uh, environment, especially for the city or to plan better for the city. And then when you talk about resilient, I think we were able to talk about this on the previous modules, stability to absorb, recover, and prepare for future shocks. But I would like to highlight the second point here on resiliency, cities performing well on six characteristics. So these are the different elements that smart city would want to focus on, which is the economy, the environment, mobility, people, living, and governance. So these are some of the key points for every smart city movement that they try to do. So some factual information, smart city works in the context of being smart, being innovative, being resilient and being holistic, trying to really look at every aspect of development, especially that works on every city. So this is one of the proposed smart city analytical framework uh, from the ADB. So if you're going to look at uh, it, there are enabling factors that, uh, that they provided. And you can see technology innovation is just one of the factors that is really important. This and uh, the other one is the digital skills and capacity. So if you're going to uh, compare it with the concept of digital city, so these two enablers are only 
uh, the factors considered for digital city. But when you talk about smart city, it really looks at other intricate enabling factors contributive for us to be able to measure or provide solutions to the different problems. So such urban planning issues are enumerated here. So these are the common uh, issues and concern addressed when you want to go uh, on a smart city uh, uh, future or direction. And then, of course, you have the high level objectives, being green, being inclusive, being competitive, and being resilient. So those are, are the measures no? or the objectives for every smart city. And then again, just to provide the contextualization, frameworks and models for smart city exist and be first, uh, but uh, the commonalities are the, those mentioned here in the analytical framework. And then there are standards now that is actually being used when we try to go uh, into a smart city. The, uh, direction. So such as we have the ISO 37101 and ISO 37122. So if you would want to venture really in terms of the different indicators, in terms of the different uh, factors that you need to consider for your municipality or city to become, uh, to, to gear towards the direction of being smart, then you can uh, opt to look at these different uh, standards from uh, the, the ISO. So let's go to the future policy pathways for smart and inclusive city. First, we have to improve uh, smart city governance across urban systems, institutions, and act actors to overcome inequalities and to make more informed and integrated planning decisions. So in every aspect of city, we need to plan for it. And, uh, smart city movement is, is a mere uh, strategy for you to be able to, to make it every smart uh, city to go in such direction. The second uh, policy relates to encouraging technology firms to become more civic minded and create sustainable smart city solutions with social enterprises. Now, the problem here is much of the local governments would want to venture on smart city. However, if we're going to look at the context of development of every city, uh, the local government or the government side is just one aspect of, of it. The different, the other stakeholders that is equally important to look at is the private sector, the non-government organizations, and at the same time, the local community. If, for example, the private sector is not uh, equipped or is not uh, able to level with our understanding of uh, the smart city solutions, then it would be problematic or, or our directions towards being smart might not be really achieved. So it must be something that is organic to all the stakeholders they're in. And then we need to adopt cybersecurity safeguards in both digital and physical urban infrastructure development planning. Um, since uh, the concept of being smart is actually really new to a lot of local governments, a lot of uh, issues related to cybersecurity and use or processing of big data that we are having now is still limited. So we need to um, input more capability training to, to digitalize no, our uh, understanding, to digitalize our information into uh, a system uh, in, a, in a systematic way for, for the smart city movement to flourish. Okay, and then the first develop smart city investment plans that prioritize sustainable urban mobility options for the citizen. So I would just like to highlight the concept of being innovative here. So as much as possible, uh, we uh, can uh, provide other options or solutions for uh, the innovativeness to include no, as much as possible every citizen for every information to be free to the citizens that we have in our locality. And then we expand viable smart city funding mechanisms by enabling uh, cross-section partnerships and business matching platforms. Again, I would like to highlight the context of partnership as a uh, as I've mentioned before in, in our uh, nature-based solutions lecture, no? uh, partnership is really a critical aspect when we want to go to the direction of being smart. Because, of course, we know that the local government can lead the, 
the movement towards uh, smart cities, but still, no, the government uh, might lack some funds, might lack some uh, workforce, might lack some data or information that other stakeholders can be very contrib contributive of. That's why partnerships is being highlighted when we really want to achieve a smart city uh, environment. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, is a short presentation related to smart city. I hope we learned something on it and uh, we can discuss further on the different uh, movements when we talk about uh, smart city solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Edgar. Yeah. Thank you for providing that overview about the smart cities concept. And um, we like what you said now that uh, smart city initiatives are more than just being digital, uh, digitalized, no? that it requires good governance, it requires partnership and inclusivity, and it, requ it requires as well safeguards that we need to um, set uh, when we plan, design, implement, and manage these smart cities. So we'll have an open forum later uh, if you have additional questions for Dr. Edgar as well. Thank you, Dr. Edgar. You are on mute, Dr. Jen. Oh, yes. Okay. At this point, we will share our screen. So thank you very much for uh, all the mayors who submitted their assignments, um, particularly in terms of our homework. So we requested our honorable mayors to prepare three slides for a five minute presentation, uh, which covers what are their current smart technologies, what are the future smart technology projects that you're thinking about, and what are the limitations as well, whether it's statutory, institutional, infrastructure, financial, in terms of implementing these projects. So uh, we have here four, uh, we know there's a number of those who also submitted, but if it's okay, we could call on uh, the four honorable mayors who submitted. Um, so I'd like to first uh, call on um, honorable, honorable Mayor Jilur Raman Joel, the mayor of Chadpur, Bangladesh, to share um, their current and future initiatives in terms of smart cities. Honorable Mayor Jewel. Is our Honorable Mayor there? Okay. So, um, so uh, our Mayor from Bangladesh. So we'll quickly um, go through the PowerPoint. So these are the smart city initiatives currently implemented in Bangladesh in their city. Automation of issuance of certificates, particularly an online platform digital pathway, broadening the tax base, bringing the unregistered taxpayers and underserved communities to digital assessment and survey. Later on, we'll share with you the mirror summarizing the assignments as well. Okay. So aside from those current initiatives, oh, the mayor of Chanpur is here. Yes, Mayor Jewel, would you like to share this one? Thank you. Yeah, would you thank you? Uh, would you please uh, take me a little bit later for my presentation? You.
Mayor, you shared here some of uh, a number of future smart technology projects, plans, and policies as well. Okay. And these are the statutory and other limitations identified by our honorable mayor. So from funds to awareness and the technical skills. Would you like to expound on this, Mayor? Sorry, I missed your uh, say. I just got disconnected a few minutes earlier as because uh, yes, power failed. Uh, so my uh, network was, I, I didn't, uh, network was not uh, inadequate. Uh, so I missed some points of your presentation. Would you please repeat it again? Uh, Mayor, Mayor, this is your presentation. You mentioned here that one of the limitations in your city is the lack of skill and technical knowledge of some employees and uh, many of your citizens in terms of um, smart technologies. So uh, is there a specific office that you've recently assigned to work on smart city initiatives? Sorry, I didn't hear you. What? Is there a particular um, office right now in the city that manages all these projects? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a center. We have a center. But <clears throat> what I want to uh, uh, express here is that we are going to take initiatives. Uh, those initiatives needs technical skills. Those initiatives needs uh, uh, some technical skill from my municipality and uh, which is not uh, right this moment uh, is not proper even uh, because my staffs uh, those are working here many long before ago uh, those are and they are used to uh, use uh, so uh, not non-digital technologies uh, the people need to move uh, physically to the municipality to get services. Uh, they need to take uh, queues. They uh, move one table to another. Uh, so my staffs, uh, as my staffs are not aware of digital technologies, my citizens are not used to uh, adopt digital uh, facilities or services. So that is one of my uh, limitations. Uh, we have already taken uh, our, uh, initiatives to issuance of my certificates through digital platform gateways. And uh, I had to uh, engage uh, uh, diff uh, some uh, trained uh, staffs from my municipality and uh, to, uh, to, get, to provide these services. And citizens are getting aware because and so it's a challenge, but we are uh, going uh, as because we uh, we can we uh, we can uh, get the result from my one taken services. So I hope that what we are going to take in near future uh, that would be also be uh, people would, would uh, definitely going would go through this my future initiatives and they we the as it's a challenge but we are going to overcome it also thank you very much honorable mayor um it's it's we're glad that you mentioned about investing on capacity building as well uh in terms of uh, beefing up the technical as well as um how your municipality employees could better engage your citizens as well so thank you very much to honorable jewel of uh, Chanpur, Bangladesh. Okay. Next is our Honorable Mayor from Cyber Jayas, uh, to feature the Cyber Jayas uh, Honorable Mayor Datu Haji and Hamid bin Hussein. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, from uh, Sepang, uh, Cyber Jaya. So uh, I will present today about the initiative at Cyberjaya, 
one uh, of our project uh, is about as well uh, have upgrade the first one uh, upgrade uh, straight lighting in our in cyberjaya uh, we using uh, <coughs> technology uh, now we already upgrade uh, 350 uh, straight lighting uh, along protocol road in our area to monitor the traffic the straight lighting uh, using uh, uh, technology. Uh, this one to monitor and alert office from HQ and condition on the straight lighting. Uh, this one, one of the our project, and then also can generate electricity consumption and also uh, can collect the data uh, carbon emission for analysis. These are one of the project, and then uh, the second one is uh, about the traffic management. Actually in Cyberjaya or in Sepang also, and also at our state. Uh, we also uh, using uh, technology for charging uh, uh, parking rate, uh, charge parking. Jadi, uh, basically, this system have to reduce uh, congestion and improve uh, traffic management system and uh, circulation within uh, public parking space. A uh, user can easily download and install the apps and app store uh, or Google Play, Google Play to make a payment on a public parking area. Uh, yes, hopefully cashless with online street parking payment uh, where the council could save costs from uh, building a physically ticketing kiosk. Jadi, uh, paperless uh, ticketing where user uh, can track and also they know, monitor their remaining parking time and user friendly and help to save the environment. And then uh, this one also, the enforcement team also can, uh, you know, from uh, Sepang Municipal also can easily track unpaid vehicle, uh, park and uh, design public parking area and uh, can be uh, do the enforcement. Okay, uh, actually, uh, this are one of, uh, these are two projects. Actually, uh, for the management, actually, uh, we do many uh, <coughs> uh, initiative. Uh, for example, uh, also we have a uh, do a payment online on the assessment, online application on uh, business license, uh, and also online submission uh, for development and also uh, building uh, permit. Uh, permit eh? Okay, uh, and then uh, now we go to the future project. <clears throat> the future project actually uh, uh, to become an intelligent operation center. Uh, is the common center of a smart city. Uh, monitoring uh, city operation in real time with uh, interconnection of information has many benefits from accelerating emergency response and enabling cross uh, agency collaboration uh, to simulating city operation uh, to facilitate intelligent uh, discussion making using big data analysis and uh, assisting city development planning. Uh, the future intelligent operation center will uh, mainly focus uh, and expect uh, uh, analytical CCTV for real time monitoring of city operation such as uh, traffic management, urban safety, uh, illegal uh, waste and dumping, uh, flood management, and more. Uh, the smart uh, dashboard uh, urban observ observatory will be display information such as population, housing, uh, microeconomy, and also geographical data. Uh, this will be for decision making, monitoring, and alert, as well as a collaborative command of emergencies between inter agencies. Okay, statutory uh, li limitation. Actually, uh, legislation and act is part of the city planning and uh, development. In uh, many experience, uh, it required amendment to the existing act to be mandatory for the implementation of smart cities program or project. This is because the existing implementation uh, more uh, mostly uh, implementation uh, based on volunteer. With emerging uh, technology and innovation product, the existing regulation uh, of federal and state local and need to be in line with the uh, ever-changing environment, some development of innovative product in city is treated by the old regulation and uh, X. Okay, implementation uh, limitation. In terms of project implementation, the main limitation 
is on development and maintenance costs. Uh, a long uh, term business uh, plan that uh, suit every uh, parties are needed to run a specific smart city program project. We said that in line uh, with technological advance, the community, private sector, and government agencies need uh, to cope uh, to be in line with the changing digitalization uh, environment for the better city uh, management landscape. The readiness of city infrastructure to serve uh, emerging technology is also one of the main limitation. The people in the city will enjoy a better upgrade rather than people living in rural areas with the demand of the supply uh, factor. One of the problem in our area because the uh, Wi-Fi coverage and then also the communication uh, limitation. That's one of the problem uh, to become as a smart uh, solution or smart city. I think that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mayor. Um, exciting uh, future plan as well. So, uh, but yeah, um, agree with uh, with your sharing in terms of limitation. Uh, it's nice to note about the you highlighted about the readiness, not only of the infrastructure but also of the people. The readiness in terms of the use of, of this technology. So thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mayor, okay. for sharing these uh, projects. So later on, we'll kind of unpack it more. Okay. okay thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Next is Honorable Mayor from the city of Kubamula, Ismail. Honorable Mayor Ismail Raf Rafik. Is Honorable Mayor Rafik here? So maybe we'll go through quickly um, from Puba Mula. So basically, there's no specific smart technologies at the moment, uh, but there's a high mobile phone adoption and uh, availability of a high-speed mobile network. Okay, is uh, Mayor here? Yes, uh, there's a number of plans. Uh, to implement in terms of uh, smart technology projects, we have the high-speed open access network, services the digitalization, maybe as mentioned, just like in uh, Cyberjaya and uh, in the earlier presentation from Bangladesh as well, IT literacy, in, uh, using smart technologies for disaster response, traffic management, including the street lights. And what are the basic limitations? So we have from, uh, of course, uh, in terms of policies and also the expertise or the readiness no, of, of the different uh, offices. Funds is always an issue. Uh, and um, just like uh, Honorable Mayor Hamid, no, um, they, um, they mentioned about the laws and regulation, uh, which also limits the full implementation of smart city initiatives. Okay. And then, lastly, we have from the city mayor uh, of Iloilo City, Philippines, we have Honorable Mayor Jerry Trenas. Is Honorable Jerry here? Honorable Jerry Trenas? Okay, so... Um, just breezing through. Uh, similar with other areas, we have electronic business permitting and licensing systems. Um, this one is uh, maybe our mayor from uh, Kuva Mula could also talk to Iloilo in terms of um, implementing the Action Response Center. So they have two being completed, a command center in Gaisano, Iloilo City Center. Gaisano is one of the malls here in the Philippines will be a centralized command system okay, to include hazard sensor networks, CCTV monitoring, and will house the Disaster Risk Reduction Management Office, Public Safety and Transportation Management Office, police and fire stations, okay, and additional free public Wi-Fi internet access in partnership with the different telecom giants here in the Philippines. Uh, some of the future smart technology projects um, this is in partnership with the Department of Science and Technology, the University of the Philippines, and also a private sector. So they call it the Project Lungsod under the Smart Cities Program. 
and uh, the UP Training Center for Applied Geodesy and Photogrammetry. Okay. And um, a city command is serves as a central nervous system, and will uh, and they will have the city connect, which is a mobile application which will help connect the citizens with basic city services, which includes geo visualization, feedback, social sensing mechanism of appropriate data. So if we see here, um, uh, the use of different applications and technologies from mapping to communication in order for the city to have uh, an evidence-based and a real-time um, advice regarding their response and regarding their design of their smart cities. Okay, uh, I think similar with uh, what Mayor Hamid and uh, Mayor uh, Jewel as well has mentioned, um, the the funds to avail of this technology, the readiness of the infrastructure, the alignment harmonization of systems provided by the national government and the systems utilized by the local government. So um, if we see a new, because we know that technology changes a lot and fast. So uh, in terms of, uh, of course, as uh, from the government, we're also limited in terms of our procurement. So we cannot just purchase as much as we want to or as much as, we, as fast as we want it to. So the need to capacitate implementing offices for new technologies and systems. Okay. Oops, sorry. So, um, so I think, um, Anne, could, is it okay to share initially the mirror that we have just to sum up the, uh, uh, some of the assignments, uh, uh, even not presented here? Thank you, Dr. Anne. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer. I'm just copying the link to the board, which I will place in the chat so that if you would like to go there, um, via that link, it will give you a sense in a very distilled fashion of the contributions of many of our honorable mayors and provides an opportunity to look at and be able to reflect on um, in broad strokes, some of what has already been deployed in, in multiple cases, the things that our honorable mayors are looking to for the future in terms of goals and, and plans that are underway and the limitations that have been identified that Dr. Jennifer was um, just, just discussing. Um, and Dr. Jennifer, if, I, if you would like to talk about the questions that we're gonna, we're gonna turn to in the breakout sessions, or if you like, I can, I can talk a little bit about the things that have been identified and, and the kind of groupings that we've, we've brought together here. Uh, maybe you could sum up this first, Anne, uh, before we call the next speaker. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the, the effort with the Miro board here was to distill from the insights and the contributions of various honorable mayors to think about some of the things that have already been deployed with room to add others, should we wish. Um, so some of the things that you have heard, Honorable Mayor Hamid bin Hossein and Honorable Mayor Chandpur and, and the, the synopsis provided by Dr. Jennifer of, of initiatives that are underway in various cities. Um, from the this, this smart street lights to conserve energy use and, and to uh, you know, go on and off at, at the optimal times to the existing establishment of free Wi-Fi zones in, in, in particular cities, using digital portals and online permitting um, for both providing of certificates, uh, permitting businesses, uh, conducting assessment and survey of tax parcels that as more and different cities are, are enlisting these technologies, it provides an opportunity to streamline these processes and to conserve resources. Um, things like the Eye Care Action Response Center, which is uh, very impressive in terms of um, enlisting technology to respond to citizen and resident needs, and the flex parking, um, you, uh, providing parking and, and issuing citations without, without using cash or paper in any way. So these are some of the technologies that are already in existence and being deployed. And then we see and heard from various mayors. And, and I think here we're seeing opportunities for mayors and cities to learn from one another or to, to um, have the example of, um, or to simply network and, and share what has been done in some places. So 
the move to establish free Wi-Fi zones in, in various cities or to use closed circuit camera systems and, and um, to, um, enlist e existing technology to gather data across different cities. The SMART uh, Geo ICT, the, the kind of combined project that we heard a little bit about, the City Connect and City Command um, capacities to respond to, to challenges uh, linked and, and related to an intelligent operations center. Um, all of these things around the optimal use of resources, and then we get into natural resource use and, and conservation and, and smart um, smart distribution, whether it's auto waste processing or alternative energy such as solar, um, that there are these various initiatives that, that bear directly upon the environmental resources that we all depend upon. So finally, as we all know in the governance setting that we're operating in, there's the challenge of aligning between national, state and local systems of delivery, as well as the governing institutions and policies that exist and are in place the ability to provide sufficient technical knowledge for employees and citizens and residents to be able to implement and sustain these technological systems, should we be able to capitalize them and build them. Um, this means developing capacity and offices and staff to have the um, have the uh, support and resources to be able to serve citizens and residents in these ways, building awareness and education. And um, some of the limitations around infrastructure that exist in different in different jurisdictions, whether that is internet infrastructure, which is clearly a really important and, and widespread need that, that all cities have, to um, the delivery mechanisms and the um, existing capacity within, within systems. Um, so as a, as a broad strokes overview, this gives us a sense and, and um, the consistency that we're seeing also from the, from the initiatives that the mayors have provided. With that, I'll turn back to you, Dr. Jen. Thank you very much, Dr. Ann. So that sums up initially the uh, submissions of our honorable mayors. So basically, all, almost all our uh, mayors have their smart city initiatives already. Um, and there's a lot of future plans as well. And as Dr. Anne has mentioned, there's, of course, a lot of limitation in terms of readiness, whether it's infrastructure, in terms of the social capital, and the need to really harness our partnerships and uh, the citizens as well uh, in terms of our smart cities are the key issues that you will unpack a while ago. Uh, uh, next uh, in the next sessions. So uh, for the for our next session, so let me stop sharing okay, and share with you the other. Please, you're seeing this one now. Okay, so for our next part of the program, so we'll have a series of speakers. Our speakers for this afternoon are practitioners and experts in their own field uh, that they will share practical and pragmatic um, advices and uh, things that we could learn from in terms of smart cities. So let me, it's an honor to introduce to you our uh, second speaker for this afternoon. It's um, Miss Janat is an Australian born Punjabi and mother of three based in the in Waikato, New Zealand. She is a CPA and a former CIO with a master's in digital business and is actively engaged in New Zealand technology ecosystem with a focus on leveraging technology in innovative ways to benefit people and planet. Janat is the Interim Executive Director at Smart Cities Council, Australia, New Zealand, to present Smart City Council initiatives, insight, challenges, and opportunity, Ms. Janat Makbul. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Janat, we can hear you clearly. All right. Firstly, thank you for the invitation. So um, I'm just going to dive right into the presentation because I understand um, we don't have a lot of time. I think I've got 10 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, I think I've got 10 minutes, haven't I? Yes, Jenna, thank you. Great. And to 15 minutes. Yeah, all right. And will you just move the slides for me? Sorry for all the questions. Yes. 
Yeah, okay. So um, Smart Cities Council Australia New Zealand um, has been around for about, I think, 12 years now. Um, so arguably, the, we're the world's largest repository, or we have rather the world's largest repository of knowledge resources around all things uh, focused on leveraging technology and data um, for smart cities. And so as part of that, we obviously also have a, um, a huge base of stakeholders across the world. We have offices in North America, Southeast Asia, India, and then um, across Australia, New Zealand. So for the past two years till February, I was the country director for New Zealand. And now I've just stepped into the interim executive director role across Australia, New Zealand. Next slide. So what I'm going to talk about specifically, the focus across Australia and New Zealand isn't just major cities, it's, it's the cities and the towns and the regions. And so I wanted to have a look at some of the key technologies that we're hearing about and that people are trying to innovate with, and then have a look at the drivers, challenges, opportunities. And then what I feel is important and what we feel is important and we've learned across those years and what we hear from our, um, our stakeholders, which is, uh, which is public and private sector. Um, and the communities. And then, and then a, just a short bit at the end around where we feel in terms of um, moving with smart cities, the focus should be for time, effort and money. Next slide. So smart cities. So when we think about smart, we don't always talk about technology, obviously. So um, smart can be anything that really enhances um, a, certain, a certain position from where it is currently to where you, where you need it to be. And it benefits a um, you know, there, there is a benefit. So if you look at the specific, if you look at smart goals, for example, if you look at it from that perspective, they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, realistic and timely. So from a smart cities perspective, even if we just focused on that, we need to make sure that what we're doing is specific and it's measurable both along the way, but also in terms of the impact that we're making, that really we don't set goals from the outset that are, um, that are, um, you know, that, 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 that alter the pace of our progress and actually um, in the end are detrimental um, and then being realistic and timely obviously with those as well and so if you think of other definitions of smart it's about being clean tidy and well dressed it's about having or showing intelligence and then it's about acumen so so really smart as in smart cities encapsulate encapsulates quite a lot whoops All right, next slide, sorry, yep. Okay, so uh, again, so the focus here is um, is technology, data and innovation. So I feel like we, I feel like there's tech and then there's data and then there's trying to solve, come up with um, problems that you actually have a solution for and it becomes a, a um, individual instances of solutions rather than an approach that's really innovation. And, I, and when I talk about innovation, I also talk about inclusive innovation, which means really taking your, your citizens and your staff and other stakeholders on that journey with you. Next slide. Now, smart, smart in the sense of a city um, isn't a, a new concept. So even if you think of the traffic light, I mean, imagine, imagine there was no traffic lights and suddenly there were traffic lights. I mean, I think somebody would argue at the time that that was smart. I mean, there are obviously other examples as well. Um, the first urban big data project actually took place in Los Angeles in 1974. And then you've got Amsterdam, which, is, which was, um, they were talking about creating a virtual digital city back in 1994. And then in um, the Smart City World Expo um, Congress, I think it was a World Congress was held in Barcelona back in 2011. So it's not, a, and even before that is the traffic light and even before that is planning in general and just the ability to move around a city more effectively and just to be able to be supported by infrastructure in a city and assets in a city more effectively for our citizens. But it's always been about the same thing. So if you go to the next slide. It's always been about livable, workable, sustainable. So our, our cities should be more livable. Our cities um, should be um, cohesive to what work looks like in the different forms of work. So whether, whether we look at that from the perspective of the future of work or whether we look at it from the perspective of just um, you know, maintaining infrastructure and assets, if we took a look at it from the perspective of construction, we look at it from the perspective of trans, uh, transport and mobility. Um, so just working and living with all of that in mind, but also sustainability and sustainability in its entire context. So we're talking about um, at the level of recycling and the circular economy is a big buzzword at the moment, sustainable for the environment, sustainable in terms of longevity of, of the infrastructure and the assets and, and all the solutions that you put in place in the planning processes and the spatial designs 
and then sustainable in the sense of um, you know the effort is sustainable to ensure that over years and over generations a smart city remains smart you don't want to have to come back in a decade's time and think oh well you know that's no longer smart anymore because we actually didn't have a roadmap next slide so the city strategy needs to then thread through livable workable and sustainable and so often i get asked by um, local government and um you know cities and we get you know is do you start with the strategy and then you just work on focused on implementing that strategy and i say the strategy needs to be flexible because things change and you also have to make sure that you're incorporating into the strategy all the different stakeholders and so if you look at it from the perspective of livable workable sustainable you're more likely to then consider the wide scope of stakeholders so i'm talking about people and planet i'm talking about your citizens but also visitors to the city i'm talking about your staff in an organization if you think about smart council i'm thinking about um, office workers as well as outdoors i'm thinking about education spaces i'm thinking about um, you know animals you know and things like that so sustainability environmental sustainability we all have heard about obviously and know about climate change so what does that look like from that perspective and so if you have livable workable sustainable in mind which is our big focus at smart cities council and our work is underpinned by the sustainable development goals then your smart city strategy will consider all the different stakeholders and the only other thing i would add is just to ensure that it's flexible and it's a roadmap it's not a destination next slide so if you think about the technology then, so IoT, um, this is, I mean, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide. I'm assuming that there's a bit of knowledge out there around these three pieces of technology, but these are the ones that are quite topical. So, um, you know, collecting the data, sharing the data around, and then analyzing the data is probably the three focus areas from a smart perspective, if you think about cities of the future. Next slide. So the value, this is from Thomas Edison, so the value of an idea lies in the using of it. So it's all well and good to have the technology. And I talked about this before about tech and data, but actually what it's the impact that you're making in the application of technology in the sense of livable, workable and sustainable where you need to focus your attention. So it's not about having a technology solution and finding a problem for it. It's the other way around. What is it that you're trying to solve? What is it that you're trying to make better? Who is the stakeholder that you're working with and in what capacity in the sense of livable, workable, sustainable? And then let's go out and have a look. And sometimes, as, I, as we've seen the definition of smart, sometimes it's not um, a specific tech or data solution. And even if it is a tech and data solution, you really need to take an integrated approach. So you're looking at, a, um, at the application of a solution across a number of areas to both, first of all, maximize the investment, but secondly, the impact. Next slide. So where are things at across Australia, New Zealand and elsewhere? And in the elsewhere, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, um, often when we do these presentations, I talk a lot about um, cities in Asia. So I won't, I won't um, add that to today's presentation, but to just, just to give you an idea. So in Australia, we run an event every year called Smart Cities Week, about 350 to 400 people from across the ecosystem come together for three days. Um, we've held it in Sydney in 2018, 2019. And it's probably half of, more than half of the audience is public sector and then the rest of it is solution providers. And we get them together, we connect them. That is our whole job at Smart Cities Council is to support and facilitate the Smart Cities ecosystem through connection and enablement and knowledge sharing um, and facilitate knowledge sharing. And so Smart Cities Week 2019, which was the last time that we held it in person, but hopefully um, we're just squaring up the final details, but Smart Cities Week 2022 will be again in person in Melbourne from the 17th to the 21st of October. But at, 2020, at 2019, I was there, I was there in 2018 and 2019. So um, some of the specific projects, and we actually run a Smart Cities Awards across Australia and New Zealand as well. So some of the examples, um, Moreton Bay Regional Council, which is in Queensland, um, they're using dash cams on garbage trucks to actually scan at the same time the, the quality of the roading infrastructure for potholes and things and, and, and to, to be able to predict and prioritise maintenance. In um, Canterbury Bankstown, which is in Sydney, so it's in Western Sydney, um, the biggest benefits for their community in terms of smart cities was a, wasn't around rolling out little technology so solutions, but it was around just the way that the council operated in terms of being more transparent and um, listening to their residents. So their sort of thinking around smart was just how do we engage better with our citizens. 
We've got uh, Len Lease um, in, in New South Wales, I think it is, that's work, that's looking at um, or talked about autonomous buildings. So that's back in 2019. The 2020 um, Smart Cities Award winners, um, even though we didn't have the event, was the city of Darwin, which has developed a privacy framework, is uh, Morton Bray Regional Council for their data leadership. And that's a huge focus at um, Smart Cities Council because once you've collected the data and you've crunched the data um, and you've done something with the data across all that, there actually needs to be um, an emphasis on data leadership. And that looks at trust and privacy and ethics, for example. Um, Lake Macquarie City Council won an award for smart beaches. Um, in New Zealand, um, there was a there was an IDC Smart Cities Awards and, and an Auckland one um, for a similar solution. Yeah. The city of Casey um, won an award for just the impact across citizens and engaging citizens in their practices around privacy and data. Um, the, one of the one of the other ones that I want to um, talk about was Brisbane, which actually run won the Smart Cities Readiness Challenge uh, for 2020. So the Smart Cities Re Readiness Challenge is something that the Smart Cities Council runs across the globe, and um, Brisbane won actually as one of the cities, and so they're developing a um, data dividend for the community. So they've got an Internet of Things network that spans about 200 square kilometers. And it's being deployed, and this is back in 2019, remember, so 2019, 2020, um, to monitor mosquitoes, monitor water quality, um, monitor soil moisture, um, and detect sort of when the levels are at a certain um, certain stage that, you know, some action is required. Um, they deployed 20 smart poles in the inner city and across suburban precincts um, to capture contextual information relevant to the um, mobility. So people moving around, cyclists moving around, traffic moving around. So they're using smart po poles for that. And then they converted all the data. And this is the, this is the thing. So you can have all, as many of those sort of sensing devices and infrastructure around, but if you don't do something with the data and analyze the data, but also get it to where it needs to go, whether that be to another device to trigger an activity or whether it needs to be to a group to, um, to share insights. So whether that be with your community or actually decision makers, that's sort of the, the life cycle or the, or the trajectory of the data that you need to be thinking. And that's why data leadership is quite important. In New Zealand, um, I was actually, I'll talk about um, one example. So I was the smart cities advisor for Hamilton City Council, which for two years. So that's um, sort of the uh, Top central North Island, and it's got a population of 168,000 people, and it's the biggest city in the region, and it's the fastest growing city in the country. So we actually won in 2021 the top 50 smart city governments or government award that's run by the Eden Institute or the Eden Strategy Institute. So we came 21st globally out of 50. And it was because, um, and I remember reading the submission and reviewing the submission um, with the with the smart cities lead and going over it again. And so our focus was about smart society. So it wasn't so much on tech and data, but it was about how does the everyday, how can we improve everyday life in the city and make it as easy as possible for the people that live in the city, work in the city and for the city itself and the environment itself. And so that was our focus. So it was all about good decision making and who needed to get, who needed to make the decisions, whether that being individual about whether they should get on the road that day on a bike and what the congestion was looking like in terms of traffic, whether it was about where the nearest e-scooter was and, what, you know, should they take that option, whether it was, you know, other, other decisions at an individual level or whether it was at a city level about bridge maintenance, about um, planning for the future, about... Um, buildings, you know, we, you know, um, consents for buildings, consents for roads. Um, so we focused on who needed to make a decision and then we focused on the information that they needed to make the decision. And then we looked at technology and data. And then we talked, and then the third focus was um, the community. So it was about what, where were they going as communities and how could we um, support them to do this, but not take ownership of their own progress as a community. And so I'm thinking there about indigenous communities, but I'm also thinking about the ethnic communities. And I'm also just thinking of the community of the city as a whole. Um, and and what, what is it that they wanted to achieve? Where were they headed? And how could we support them as a smart city? Again, not necessarily just technology and data. So we, there was a ton of collaboration, private public partnerships, um, you know, collaborating engagement with the community, 
Um, we had a space where the community could come and ask questions about technology and there were um, example solutions there for them to play with. There were opportunities to provide feedback. Design thinking was used to capture initiatives and ideas that the citizens were thinking about. Um, there was a big focus on culture and, and what the what technology and data could be could do to, um, to how technology and data could be leveraged around culture. So I don't know if you've heard, but the first um, river in the world that's been um, mapped using Google Maps was in New Zealand. And so the Waikato River is now um, being mapped by Google Maps. So there was the there was the um, and then the key component of it was also digital equity and digital inclusion. So we wanted to make sure that if we were moving to leverage technology and data more, that we were taking everybody with us. And that meant that we needed to make sure that people were actually engaged and could engage through access, trust, motivation, and digital literacy. Um, and then we, and then there was a component of it around jet, um, enabling innovation. So we made um, open data available so that other people could actually then start looking at the data and coming up with their own solutions. Elsewhere, the only thing that I'll mention under elsewhere is that the developing world is actually leapfrogging uh, the developed world. And so I actually keep a really keen eye on countries where from nothing they can build smart cities from scratch. Um, and, you know, there's examples of that going on um, in, in Saudi Arabia. There's examples of that in India, in Africa. And so I watch that with a very keen eye and I recommend that others do too, because they're, they're um, moving from a you know a completely green slate to be able to establish smart cities and it's similar to what the future of place looks like um, because people now due to COVID are wanting to work from where they want to work instead of coming into the city and instead of even living in a city and so the future of place is really how can technology and data enable smart like a city in our rural areas um, and our regional areas. Next slide. So drivers, challenges and opportunities. The, the drivers really have to be about people. People. It has to be about livable, workable, sustainable. You need to think about um, the, the current ecosystem. And so in New Zealand and Australia, there's quite a lot going on with digital and AI and data and digital inclusion and um, local government reform and the water reforms in New Zealand specifically. So drivers are livable, workable, sustainable for whoever it is that you're engaging with, with which will be everybody. And then the challenges are very specific to the region and the country that you're in. But the idea is that you should have a look at, um, you know, what else is going on in the wider ecosystem that you can, and that's the opportunity is what else is going on in the wider ecosystem that you can align with. So that technology isn't the driver, the impact is the driver and the ability to make that collectively through public private partnerships. And just having a little look outside just what you already focus on to see who else is doing what, maybe other organizations, other agencies, other councils, other governments, and just sort of sharing that knowledge um, across. So in the IoT, AI and emerging tech space around 5G, there's obviously challenges and opportunities around those three technologies as well. So there's, cha there's, there's challenges and opportunities that are specific to technology and data that you need to be considering. Um, we have a smart cities readiness guide that actually goes along with the smart cities readiness challenge. And we scope out a lot of the opportunities and ch ch challenges and opportunities there. And we frame up potential um, possible pathways for cities. But again, it comes back to where your city is where your city's at in your smart city's journey, where you are located, and then, and then the drivers behind the citizens and the community and the wider stakeholder group that you're looking to support. So all, uh, just to recap quickly, the all, in, next slide, sorry. The all important why, why? Livable, workable, sustainable, benefit of people and planet, simple. Keep it really simple. Next slide. Next slide, sorry, who? Yeah, making an impact. So. Um, the why, the who is the people. Sorry, we just missed one, but it was who. And then number three is about making impact. So you want to make impact again, you're circling back to the livable, workable, sustainable. Have a look what the World Economic Forum is doing. Have a look what organisations are doing in your neighbourhood. Have a look at a global level. Have a look at a local level and see who you can align with to make a collective impact. And then the last slide really is about where you should focus your time, effort and money. So from our perspective and our learnings and our engagement with stakeholders, it's about education. You need to educate the public, you need to educate your own staff, you need to educate your stakeholders, you need to educate the, the wider ecosystem before you even move down the road of, of a smart city strategy. And you have to consider what smart looks like as part of that education. You have to think about what tech and data looks like. Um, where are people at in terms of the digital divide, for example? Enabling connectivity is the next one. So um, connect people, connect things. 
What does that look like? What does the infrastructure look like? So that actually you're able to provide a scaled solution from day one rather than just piloting a number of different solutions because the minute it doesn't make the impact that you've promised on a scale, the project dies. And so you really wanna be designing for scale from day one, the same way you should be designing for privacy, the same way you should be designing for security. And when you um, are considering um, you know, what is smart in terms of the application of smart, think about um, you know, co-creating what SMART looks like with your stakeholders and co-creating those spaces where um, engagement can happen between the different stakeholders because then your effort is a, lot set, uh, is a lot less because you've actually got a lot of people buying into where you're headed and actually they'll partner with you. Um, so collaboration is, is a must. Um, and then in terms of money, you know, think about again, circling back to SMART. So think about measuring, being very specific with what you're aiming to do, having a roadmap rather than a target, um, measuring as you go, measuring impact, measuring also, um, you know, where your return on investment is, being transparent around that. So you're communicating your goals and you're communicating where you're at in terms of progress. Make sure your goals are achievable, make sure they're realistic and make sure they're timely, both in the sense of impact, but also in the sense of who needs to be involved, because the last thing you want is to set some goals and you haven't considered everybody that you need to be on board with the journey and then they're suddenly not available. Um, so it's basic project planning really. Know where you're headed, take the right people along with you and communicate. And that's really all I had um, for as a presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenna, for that interesting and very insightful presentation about uh, the Smart City Council um, initiatives and experiences in terms of smart city. All right, maybe we could accommodate one to two questions initially before we go to that. So if you have questions, clarifications. It's nice that Janat um, highlighted um, learning from others uh, and it's very keen in terms of different cities also implementing smart cities initiatives, uh, what works with them, uh, also their challenges. And I think uh, the Asia Pacific Mayors Academy could be a platform for the mayors to learn from each other, uh, to uh, you know, uh, share best practices as well, um, and also um, learn from, uh, uh, we like the word co-creating uh, and engagement because that's the focus of uh, module 5B as well. So uh, if you have questions, honorable mayors, clarifications, how Smart Cities Council did it, Let me check the chat if there's a question here. Um, Janet, you mentioned about incentives. Um, I think that's also one of the things uh, that, um, you know, uh, that could also encourage innovation. Uh, these incentives came from the government or is it from the uh, pri public private partnership initiative? So in Australia, the government put out two pots of money of millions. I think there was 30 something and maybe, 20, I mean, don't quote me, but there were two lots of millions of dollars that were allocated and cities were asked to apply. Um, just, just actually this week or late last week, um, there's also been a new um, pot of money, but less like $3 million that's been put up around an innovation challenge. Uh, what they didn't do at the same time was actually to um, have uh, a framework for cities to follow and some education program. And so unfortunately, a lot of that investment's gone into some cities have done really well, um, but some cities actually spent it on tech and data and now they're waiting to see what they use it for <laughs> so, or how they use it effectively um, in New Zealand. Um, really, it's the cities themselves. So there's 78 wow. councils in New Zealand and probably um, you know, a good, a good number of them are actually re doing really well in the smart cities. You know, Auckland wins a number of awards. Wellington wins. When it, Wellington has just won the, um, a global award, actually. And I talked about Hamilton um, and Dunedin, you know, the main centres, but also the small cities and towns and regions are doing some very cool things, but all self-funded, so funded from rates. And so there's a, there's a bigger sort of um, answerable piece back to the community when you're using your ratepayers' money. Um, but definitely in Australia, there's been pots of investment. Yeah, uh, any more questions? Uh, I think one of the things that was highlighted by the mayors was also uh, building the capacity of their um, staff. Uh, is there an uh, opportunity for, for example, uh, uh, Smart Cities Council also um, 
uh, connecting with these with the mayors of the Asia Pacific, um, the the APMA in terms of these capacity building initiatives. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of our key pillars is the Smart Cities Academy, and so we run a Smart Cities Certified Practitioner Program through there. Um, and we launched that last year. We've already got 400 certified practitioners around the world. Um, that's available to consume at your at your um, you know, online, it's like an online program. So I can definitely send you some information about that one. Um, and, and then you get a certified, yeah, you, you're, and then you have to do 15 hours per year of professional development. And we support you to do that as well. And then you become part of a global smart city certified practitioner community. And there's an opportunity to engage with um, other practitioners around the world. And we're scaling that out globally. It was a, it was a, it was a trial over COVID and it just has, um, we just have so many people interested in it that we used to run a one day online webinar for it, but now we're actually moving it to a completely online platform. And so I can send you information. There's definitely, and then come down, visit, you know, when this, when we're able to travel, come to Smart Cities Week, it's like 300 or 400 people from across Australia, New Zealand that are all focused on Smart Cities. They're there in the room with you for three days. There's an opportunity to connect, to, to engage, to share. Um, yeah, absolutely, come visit. Thank you very much, Janat. I think honorable mayors and our partners, that's an invitation from Smart Cities Council. Just let us know when the, the time is, Janat, and we'll be glad to visit. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. I will send you the information. Thank you so much for listening. All right. Thank All right. Uh, okay, so a, a round of applause, please, for uh, Janat Bakbul from Smart Cities Council. Really exciting activities, Janat, being led by FCC ANZ from Tam Huang. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll move on to our next uh, speaker. Okay, let me share again my screen. Okay, so our next speaker is the Sustainability Director of Stratcon Philippines. So a uh, private sector provider of smart uh, city initiatives to provide the uh, smart solutions and power metering here in the Philippines and I think uh, also part of Asia. Let me call on Colin Stilly. Colin, take it away. Hi everybody, thanks Jennifer. Uh, hi and good day esteemed mayors and guests. So my name is Colin Steele and I'm a director for Stratcon. Stratcon is a Philippines-based ESCO qualified by the Department of Energy. We also have a representative office in Singapore, which helps us distribute some of the technology that we work with, as you can see here. Uh, some of the technology might be familiar with you guys, such as Signify. It's the Philips uh, lighting solution. Um, and we, 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 we come to market to help commercial industrial facilities address RA11285, which is the Philippine Energy Efficiency and Conservation Law. And through that undertaking, we provide ESCO services. So how do we go about this? Well, you know, it would be great if we could implement these technologies and have the energy savings that we're looking for for companies to meet their RA11285 compliance requirements. But for us, we put a heavy emphasis on installing smart power monitoring technology because it's only through that that you can actually establish the baselines and see the potential gains from any energy efficiency undertaking. But we go, we do more than that, right? I think, I think, I think the energy smart power monitoring is an essential tool to every single facility, either commercial and industrial throughout the region. From my experience, you know, visiting uh, a, a number, well, over about 100 commercial industrial facilities doing ocular inspections, there have been very little that actually have either an energy conservation uh, monitoring or BMS, right? And if they don't have that, then there's even less chances that they have uh, smart power monitoring. Now, the smart power monitoring actually gives you the where, when, and how of power consumption. Right, So it actually provides facility managers with preventive maintenance diagnostics. They can understand consumption between loads. For example, you know, various HVAC facilities in a building, if they want to turn one off to save on power, they probably want to turn off the unit that is the least efficient. So you know, apart from then providing technological solutions, it also provides facility managers insights on simple managerial solutions on being able to reduce uh, 
power consumption. And this can be anything from, you know, basic switching off lights that aren't being used at night uh, through to identifying where loads shouldn't be being consumed in certain parts of the building when they are. So once we establish, you know, uh, smart power monitoring, then we can go in and identify which are the low-lying fruit and provide uh, tailor-made solutions to specific uh, industrial facilities. But we, we, we have a regional distribution and reseller agreement with SMAPI, uh, and we find this technology exceptional because it provides value for money both on the hardware but also on the software. It provides a free basic user license for the life of the product. And all that information should be sufficient to be able to track progress on any energy efficiency undertaking, as well as live uh, monitoring of a facility's energy consumption. We like it because it can monitor up to 28 loads, single phase loads on one unit, or nine three phase loads under a Y configuration, or 14 three-phase loads under a delta configuration. You can also add water, gas, and other inputs. So for that purpose, it makes a very good ESG reporting tool. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. I mean, you know, SMAPI have designed their technology to include the SMAPI input and SMAPI output. So if you want to include other energy sources that have a pulse meter, then you can actually read it on the same dashboard. But the control part is quite interesting. And now, yes, it quite is, is, is fairly rudimentary, but we've been able to apply it in even simple resorts where we want to turn loads off at the main breaker. So that re reduces all phantom power consumption within a facility on specific loads. Um, SMAPI can use 50 amp uh, CT, so you can get quite small loads right up to 10,000 amps. So it pretty much covers every low voltage uh, circuit uh, globally. Uh, it has two days of data storage in case the internet conks out, uh, and we have provided a different number of different options to connect to the cloud. It also is able to connect through to a local BMS through RS-485. So it is the most versatile tool that we have come across, and we're very happy to be using that. Um, just to go through the technologies that we use, Signify is Philips lighting solution. So we use quite high quality lighting, LED lighting solutions, as well as automation technologies. Ecoline is a new Singapore based thermal, solar thermal air conditioning, or it's really a thermal air conditioning solution that uh, uses radiant heat to drive the refrigerant cooling within the system. Brainbox AI, you might be familiar with, it is a Time Magazine award-winning technology from 2020. Metron is a French startup that is able to monitor various types of energy uses within the industrial facility and tries to optimize the use through its technology. Skycool is an Australian uh, sort of uh, polymer paint that reflects up to 95% of heat off roofs. Uh, so it has a great impact on, you know, warehouses that don't use air conditioning as well as uh, facilities that do use air conditioning. 75S is an, Amer 75F is an American Indian uh, BMS solutions provider that provides technology to go into uh, brownfield buildings or existing operations and be able to implement a uh, cost-effective BMS solution that has an artificial intelligence level to optimize that system as it is. Sunscreen isn't a uh, energy technology, but we use it because uh, of COVID, the requirements to monitor uh, indoor air quality is, uh, is increasing dramatically. And with that, we can use temperature and humidity settings to then calculate real efficiencies on air conditioning and HVAC systems. And last one is VEDA. VEDA is a new type of supercapacitor technology that leaves lithium ion in the dust. It basically is uh, UPS and it provides a whole lot of other services in the battery storage uh, front, uh, which is a really exciting technology because I think what we're seeing in the distributed energy space across you know, how a smart city is gonna be able to deliver power in a stable, reliable means, I think with distributed energy coming online, batteries are certainly playing an important role there. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the one before, sorry. So just to touch on uh, the energy efficiency and conservation law, RA11285, Stratcom basically came about because of this law. Now it's a really progressive law, I think for, for, for the region and probably globally in developing countries. It requires any facility that consumes 100,000 kilowatt hours per year, which includes fuel and other energy sources, to start reporting to the Department of Energy, as well as integrate ISO 50001 into their business operations. It really gets interesting, however, at 500,000 kilowatt hours per year equivalent. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see what type one, type two designated establishments need to undertake to be compliant with this law. So yes, apart from integrating energy management system policy, Using ISO 50,000 uh, 50, they also have to report monthly energy consumption to the Department of Energy. But then they have to set up programs to develop and design measures that promote energy efficiency. You know, they have to set up annual targets, plans, and methods of measurement and verification, keep records. Um, and improve average specific energy consumption. So for the first three, you know, you could potentially use your utility bill. But if you want to get into, you know, improving average specific energy consumption, the utility bill will not be enough. And this is where smart power monitoring really comes into play, right? Um, then the last requirement is also to conduct an energy audit every three years. It's not specified whether this is a level one or level two energy audit, but what we feel is that through smart power monitoring, it really addresses all these requirements at a very fundamental level. And, and it starts a facility's journey in undertaking potential energy efficiency projects to become either net zero if they have those targets or at a minimal requirement meet the RA11285's uh, compliance requirements. Now that's really on the private sector. On the public sector, the, the law also requires for LGUs and government facilities to implement a government energy management program, which includes yearly reporting on facilities and RFPs. Now, part of these requirements on both the private and public sector do re require uh, filling in Excel files. And this is where we really feel, and we'll, we, we're undertaking uh, a pilot project using vehicle tracking technology to identify where real efficiency gains can be measured across uh, a vehicle fleet in both the private and public sector. Uh, next slide, please. So lastly, what are the sector-wide limitations? Well, you know, RA 11285 only came out in 2019, and because of COVID, they had to push a number of requirements out. That being said, the second compliance period is this April in uh, 2022. So we do hope to see that the DOE will start enforcing some of the uh, laws requirements. Uh, but to do that, you know, I think. It's very clear that EUMB, the Energy Use Management Bureau, will require further increase in resources. But for that, they don't necessarily have to have human resources. One project that we would like to be uh, working with them on is providing them a, a, a IPMV uh, monitoring and valuation tool so that they can actually automate a lot of the um, compliance re reporting by the designated entities to the Department of Energy. That being said, and, and how I started this, this sort of quick presentation is, you know, the question to all of you out there is how many commercial industrial facilities have building management systems or energy management systems, right? Uh, how many of them then provide comprehensive smart power monitoring? And I think that that you know, from my experience in Southeast Asia, this is really the fundamental requirement to get every facility on board with having and incorporating this tool into their operation because it really provides the where, when, and how power is being consumed. It gives real-time insights of how to uh, optimize the facility's management, but then it can also allow for uh, baseline, 
baselining, and then implementation of IP and VP monitoring evaluation. So it provides multiple purposes, right? And when, when clients ask me, so what's the return to investment going to be on this? This is the tool that allows for investment grade audits to be undertaken so that you can actually then more articulately project what the potential ROI would be. And from an ESCO's perspective, when we go to a bank requesting a loan for a project or undertaking, they want to have quality data. And it's really only this is the best way to be able to undertake those requirements and meet financial institutions uh, needs so that projects can actually be pushed ahead. So I'll leave it there, short and sweet, but thank you very much for your time. Very much, Colin. Yes, you're right, short but sweet. And very uh, <laughs> insightful as well in terms of the engagement of private sector in terms of uh, power, smart power metering. Okay, so we could accommodate one or two questions, uh, especially uh, coming from the mayors as well. Uh, Colin, for example, here in the Philippines, do you have a specific partner, LGU, already uh, working on this project on smart metering? Thank you. Yeah, Jennifer, that's a very good question. We, we, with, with any luck, we will be working with uh, several LGUs through a grant that we have been shortlisted for. Um, and, and, you know, the, the idea is to, to use the majority of that grant uh, to, 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 to install into this LGU's facilities. And that ranges from everything from like street markets right through the hospitals and colleges as well. Um, we're not going to use Smappy the whole way. We have another technology which is called Watt Watches. It's quite you know, popular in Australia, and that has a 3G, 4G SIM embedded into the unit. So then we don't have to rely on the facility to provide a LAN cable or internet connection, and we can still get the data. So, you know, all facilities are built differently. Um, and, and through these two technologies, we hope to cover every single LGU facility if we win the grant. And, and uh, the one that you mentioned in terms of the policy is really critical uh, for the support in these types of initiatives. So uh, are there more questions for Colin? Um, aside from the Philippines, Colin, you're working in other uh, Southeast Asia and Asia uh, countries as well, is that correct? Yeah, we do have a Singapore-based office, uh, and through that entity, we have uh, partners in Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia that we've been able to uh, install SMAPI, uh, undertaken some sales. Uh, we've got a really interesting case study in Singapore of a, of a gas station, service station that has uh, solar as well as EV charging technology, and you know through this dashboard we've been it's 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 clearly identified that the ev charging technology is the largest load for that facility so how does a facility is is how is the facility able to manage the increase in demand from the ev charging while maintaining uh their electrical integrity these are some important questions that need to be answered and your really smart power monitoring gives those insights you call it in, uh, the one that you mentioned in terms of having the quality data, uh, not only just to provide, you know, uh, or provide uh, evidence base design and management, but also it could open opportunities uh, to, to brands and partnership and support because that basically is your, your proof that, you know, and uh, I think private sector and also uh, other international development organization uh, needs to know where they could come in and that the, the, the having that quality data, which I think most of the mayor is really uh, focusing on right now, uh, is, would re be really helpful. Yeah, that's a very good point, Jennifer. And just to add on that point as well, you know, the, the, the power monitoring provides data in five minute intervals, right? So, you know, if, if, if an entity is supposed to provide a report on a monthly basis, providing total kilowatt hours and total power demand, then the uh, opportunity to game the system is, is there. But if you provide power monitoring on a five minute interval level, 
it's hard to forge that data. So there's a level of transparency and inbuilt integrity by undertaking this that you know surpasses any sort of manual approach that that would have been an alternative option. Thank you very much, Colin. All right. Any more from our colleagues? Um, Dr. Ann and I are very happy because the keywords co-create, uh, transparency, engaging the partners are really uh, popping up from our uh, the sharing of our speakers. So thank you very much for that. All right. So with that, um, a round of applause for Colin. And I think in the presentation, you have the QR code if you want to get in touch with Colin. Uh, and also the email of Colin will share it with you as well. So thank you very much, Colin, for that insightful presentation and for helping also uh, in terms of the Smart City initiatives here in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Very welcome. Thank you, too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. So with that, uh, it, the time is 1.41. We'll have a five-minute break. Uh, before we uh, go to our next two speakers and have our breakout session. So our next two speakers will come from uh, UNSCAP and also UNCB. So it's 141, please be back at 146. Please don't go out of the Zoom. Uh, you could turn off um, mute or turn off your camera. So have your coffee, have your tea and water. I'll see you in a while, 146. Thank you. Matthew, uh, Matthew, will you share your presentation directly? Is that correct? All right. Thank you,
I hope everyone's back. If everyone's back, you have your quick coffee, tea, or water. All right. So, um, let me double check. So here. Okay. All right. So um, it is an honor to present our uh, next speaker uh, to talk about smart technologies and innovation to address urban challenges, particularly the focus on air pollution. Uh, our speaker for this afternoon is an economics affairs uh, officer of the United Nations specializing, specializing in IT issues. He has over 10 years of experience working on economic and developmental aspects of information technologies. Um, he works at the UN SCAP one of the five regional commissions of the United Nations. He specialized, uh, he has specialized experience in data analytics, data warehousing, and big data application, and has been involved in preparation studies, research, and analytical papers, and lead IT projects in the public and private sector. His previous experience has included work in Beirut, Lebanon, and Heidelberg, Germany. All right, without much further ado, let me call on Mr. Matthew Perkins. Thanks very much. Very happy to be here today. Let me go straight into the slides so we can uh, get started on the content. Okay, can the secretary confirm that everything's coming through properly? So I'd like to uh, start off by taking an, an urban perspective on air pollution. We know that this is one of the greatest challenges that our cities and countries are facing uh, across the Asian continent. Uh, this is something that has high economic costs uh, and physical, personal costs to the people and, and citizens living within our cities as well. Uh, as we develop further understanding of these problems, it becomes increasingly clear that the sources of air pollution can vary significantly within a country and a region. Uh, therefore, it's really vital to take an urban centric perspective to identify the causes of pollution in individual cities so that policy action can really be focused where it will make the most difference. In this regard, we'd like to talk about some of the most common forms of pollution that are faced by our cities throughout the region. Uh, these are chemicals that we're very familiar with, such as uh, ozone, uh, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur, uh, carbon monoxide. There was recently focus added to methane in the most recent outputs of uh, the Paris Agreement and the COP. Uh, we've also had increasing attention being played to topics such as uh, black carbon and PM 2.5 the smallest pollution particles that can travel the furthest and have the most negative impacts on human health. In this uh, visual, I'd like to try to illustrate how the sources of emissions are connected to the type of compounds that will be faced. Uh, for example, uh, cities that have uh, nearby power generation plants are likely to be seeing further emissions of compounds such as sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxides, uh, whereas carbon monoxide typically tends to be more principally emitted by uh, buildings and particular matter uh, emitted by sources such as transport, industry, and in some cases, the agricultural sector. Uh, we note, unfortunately, that these sources of pollution are increasing significantly, uh, and the exposure most particularly to PM 2.5 is expected to grow by up to 50% by 2030. With particular reference to the Asia Pacific area, uh, around 85% of the region's electricity is sourced from coal, uh, and demand for this energy is expected to grow. This is a particular interest because uh, coal is one of those energy sources that in some cases can uh, pollute quite uh, significant amounts of uh, sulfur dioxide in addition to PM 2.5. Hi, Matthew. Just, just really quickly, not sure if you're sharing a visual um, on the screen should be sharing my presentation. I'd ask the secretary to confirm. You, we, we Any response from the organizers? Yeah. Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think it's coming up. Okay. Perhaps there was a lag. 
Uh, so with this slide, we're looking at the types of uh, pollutant compounds and the sources that come through with the uh, emissions themselves. Uh, each city has a different pollution profile, which indicates how the uh, activities should be focused for being able to make the most effective interventions. So with this uh, background and understanding, I'd like to talk about two specific uh, tangible interventions that can help cities make smarter decisions about facing their air pollution problems. Uh, the first solution I'd like to talk about is uh, related to data science and really getting the most knowledge that we can from the data that we have available. Uh, this particular example is what we sometimes refer to as a, a chemical profile. And with relationship to the, the points I was making in the in introduction, by looking at the distribution of the chemical compounds in the air pollution, we can specifically identify which uh, sources are causing the pollution faced by that particular city. Uh, in some cases, these profiles vary significantly. For example, Bangkok and Chiang Mai are obviously both within Thailand. Uh, however, the chemical fingerprint of the pollution sources indicate that for uh, Bangkok, it's more likely that uh, industrial and traffic activities play a larger role, whereas in Chiang Mai, it's uh, much Hi, more Hi, Matthew. Likely. Sorry to interrupt you again, um, but we don't see mm -hmm. your presentation. Could you share your presentation again? Thank you. Sorry, Matthew. Um, here's the link for Rani. Thank you. I'm not receiving any particular link. Here it's now, Matthew. Thank you. Nui, are, are you able to see the slides? Yes. Thank you. Yes, it's there. Yeah. Thank you, Kanui. So uh, hopefully the, the chart is now visually illustrating the, the point that I was making verbally of how the uh, different chemical profiles can suggest to our understanding uh, what the sources uh, of air pollution are for that particular city. Once we take advantage of, of this data and apply a machine learning modality developed by SCAP, it's possible to identify what the principal sources of pollution are for a particular area. Uh, in conjunction with our, our work with the city of Chiang Mai, for example, we've been able to establish the significance of uh, biomass uh, burning in the form of agriculture and forest fires in the areas between 100 and, and 400 kilometers for the city as being the, the chief driver of pollution during the high pollution periods for that particular location. So with this uh, data-driven approach to identifying what the uh, sources of air pollution would be, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, one of the specific projects that we can uh, offer for uh, cities uh, in the region. We have a, a program by which we work directly with cities to create a customized air pollution action plan uh, based on the uh, use of the machine learning modality which we have developed. In general, this uh, action planning process involves uh, research and uh, methodology provided by SCAP that can then be used uh, in conjunction with the mayor's offices in those cities to identify uh, a customized action plan for their city, identifying the areas and programs that will have the most impact on reducing pollution for those uh, specific challenges that they have. So those, uh, those city workshops are used to validate the baseline data and scientific evidence, uh, define the key themes and interventions, and identify what priority projects can be taken forward to really bring down the, the air pollution for that particular city. So as we engage with uh, cities who are interested in participating in this, uh, in this project intervention, uh, we will uh, schedule uh, these uh, dialogues in order to come to a clear understanding of the, the baseline in the, in the current situation and uh, move forward into the, to the action planning process. So to, to summarize this first uh, intervention uh, for the consideration of the mayor's offices on this call, uh, 
uh, where ESCAP is, is currently assisting cities in creating these air pollution action plans. Um, this is a, a, can be a, a fast and, and nimble process. It usually takes between, in general, one to three months. Uh, from your sides, it would require the input of uh, staff time and participation. Uh, from our side, the uh, SCAP offices would provide the data and analysis and support the creation of the action plan process. So if your city is interested in receiving these benefits, uh, please let us know. We would be very happy to work with your city uh, to help uh, provide this, uh, this action plan to really uh, efficiently target resources to bring down pollution uh, in your city's area. The second uh, intervention that I'd like to speak briefly about uh, is designed to help fill the, the data gap uh, that is commonly faced in, in understanding the specific uh, drivers of, of air pollution for uh, our, our specific cities. Uh, while we do have a large amount of uh, remote sensing data from satellite systems in orbit now. These uh, systems primarily allow us to identify major sources of uh, pollutants. So we can uh, make projections, we can make uh, generalized uh, observations, but it's very difficult to make specific uh, determinations at the level of, a, of individual cities. However, we're currently undertaking a project using the recently launched GEMS satellite that provides significantly higher resolution for uh, identifying pollutants at the city level throughout the region. So the GEMS project will uh, involve the installation of donated uh, ground sensor equipment together with access to the remote sensing data and technical capacity building training in order for cities, countries, ministries to be able to make use of this data at the city level to inform their action plans. Uh, this uh, photo here is a picture of the spectrometer that is uh, donated to participating cities in this project to help fill the gap of uh, combining uh, sensor insight on the ground with uh, satellite data from the sky to provide the most accurate possible insight into the uh, pollution being faced. So this uh, project uh, allows the enhancement of national and uh, regional capacity to understand how the sources of air pollution uh, at the city, regional, and uh, inter uh, and sub-regional level all uh, come together and what action should be taken to, to bring these down. So uh, to summarize this second intervention, uh, SCAP is, is working with, uh, with cities in the region uh, in order to install these uh, donated uh, ground-based sensors to provide new data on air pollution. Uh, together with the, uh, the GEM satellite system, we will then provide uh, training and capacity building so that staff at the uh, city and ministry levels within the country can understand and use this data in their fight against uh, the rising challenge of, of air pollution in the region. So uh, these two tools uh, provide a valuable uh, method to fill the data gaps that are so often encountered by our cities in the region, uh, both by taking a data-driven approach and by the provision of innovative new technologies to support the uh, air pollution action planning uh, process. I'd like to uh, briefly de describe how we take these scientific findings forward. Uh, to, to summarize for the, for the interests of time and, and smoothness of the, of the presentation, uh, the focus of these efforts is to link the scientific data available to the identified policy actions, which are shown to have the most benefit. Uh, these uh, activities are listed in the 25 Clean Air Measures uh, publication from CCAC and UNEP. So our process helps link the data on the ground for the individual city to selecting which of these clean air measures will be of the most benefit. So here's a, a quick, uh, dense uh, screenshot of uh, what some of those measures are. Normally, when we undertake our workshops and, and work with cities and, and ministries, we'll step through how to read the science to indicate which one of these solutions are most suitable. Uh, we don't have the time to go through that today, uh, but uh, SCAP is certainly very enthusiastic to work together with mayor's offices to help them through this process. And if anyone is interested in uh, taking that, please let us know and, and we will be happy to, to work with you. 
Uh, there's a, a short uh, video presentation from UNEP that summarizes these interventions. Um, I will, however, uh, skip that at this stage so we can have more time for direct interaction on this call, but I do want everyone to be aware that it exists. It's, it's, a, it's a very good uh, summary. So to uh, bring everything that I've mentioned here together, uh, we've been able to identify that using uh, innovative approaches to multiple data sources allows mayors to get more knowledge from the data that they have to identify what actions can be taken at the local level. In addition to this, we have real tangible offerings through the use of uh, satellites and remote sensing technology to help better fill some of the data gaps that are a consistent struggle in our region. And uh, as I, I come into the close, I, I do want to mention uh, one, one particular thing that I think uh, the mayors understand better than, than everyone else is that uh, they can't do it alone. We have a, a shared but uh, diversified responsibility to take action at the local level, but also in a harmonious way at the international and national level in order that everyone working together can make an, uh, the, the necessary steps to improve the, the shared commons of our atmosphere and provide uh, air quality for all. So there, there's really a shared benefit scenario here. And uh, ESCAP very much believes that the, the urban vantage point and the, the local action that we're talking about taking today needs to be complemented in harmony with international action uh, across borders and among countries so that everyone is, is doing uh, the needful steps in order to have uh, clean air for all. So uh, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, and I do want to reiterate if any of the, the mayors would like to participate as, as beneficiaries in either of the two projects that we mentioned, we would be very happy to, to work with them moving forward. So over from my side for now, thank you very much Matthew for that uh, sharing and I think the the mayors are very excited to also partner with UNSCAP with this so uh, actually after our two speakers from uh, UN uh, will have a workshop where Matthew and Paul will be there to really unpack uh, these projects and where we could uh, you know partner in terms of this so thank you very much Matthew all right so we'll be um discussing more later. All right, so with this, uh, let's go to our next speaker uh, that will talk about smart city agglomeration policy modeling for smart city implementation. Our speaker is a regional team leader for UNCDFs, local development finance practice based in Bangkok, Thailand. The transition from the private sector to UNCDF in 2015 after 20 years of global consultancy work with an especial focus on Asia and emerging economies. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Paul Martin from UNCDF. Yes, hello. Do we have the presentation I sent yet? Yes. Okay, great. I'll stop my video as well, if I may. Okay, um, so... Thank you very much for the um, uh, the invite to to actually uh, participate in this event. I think it's very very interesting, and um, we'd like today to discuss about the agglomeration policy for smart cities, and it's a key feature of a project which UNCDF are um, implementing with the ASEAN Secretariat at Jakarta. Uh, where we are in the process of uh, choosing two cities from each as in member states and working through an agglomeration policy and also developing various investments um, to sort of start to implement this policy work. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. I, I think the, the, the basis of, of, of this type of uh, agglomeration policy actually goes back in time and, and there's a lot of literature available. And I would recommend to the mayors that you ask your planning departments and policy departments to start to look at the extensive literature around city agglomerations. Um, basically, this very, very good examples um, from the Europe, Europe area, European Union. And um, it's been based on very much an historic trend. So, so if we look back at city locations in Europe, and which is also applicable for Asia uh, and ASEAN, 
Um, you know, cities are, are based around natural resources and connectivity via river and coasts. Um, we've seen from that base historic sort of development of cities, then a, a modern city location came into place where cities were developed and, and developed further uh, to link to various production networks, whether it was in the agricultural sector or I I in the industrial sector. And we've also seen recently more of a, co a, a company-based agglomeration model uh, where cities have been developed around a single manufacturer, um, large-scale global manufacturer. And there's various examples, for example, in Mexico where Intel uh, opened up a facility and really created the city agglomeration model uh, around their works. Likewise, um, interesting, you, you see the same sort of model um, in operation um, in Europe. Um, the Johnny Walker factory basically provides a, um, a city agglomeration uh, in the middle of Scotland. As we're moving into the 21st century and, and the fourth industrial revolution, we really now need to start looking at city agglomeration in terms of human capital, because the different types of skill sets and entrepreneurship levels are, are coming to play. Um, so this is really where we need to really focus our policy work going forward. Um, next slide, please. So there's some very interesting uh, research, um, basically, these are the type of things uh, we've been looking at. Uh, and there's some, a, a nice piece of work by Ikeda et al, 2012, which started to look at how cities did bureaucate, how, how they did join up. And empirical modeling has issued that um, these sort of developments have not only occurred in the past, but are uh, envisioned to occur in the future. Now, the linkage of all these sort of types of academic research is basically will help the mayors to better understand um, the upscaling and, and spatial planning related to peri-urban areas and the unplanned settlements around uh, some of the ASEAN cities, which we see. So definitively, we need to start to look at um, the agglomeration as a driver for economic growth but also for inclusivity and the sharing of urban resources. Next slide, please. So this is a base model which we are looking at um, in UNCDF in, in our ASEAN portfolio. And we really um, are fashioning the discussion around agglomeration and productive cities. As we all know, cities are and have been historically centers for production and centers for growth. Um, the corridor strategies deployed by many ASEAN countries um, have really relied upon the cities of being, becoming growth centers and productive centers. So in the new agglomeration models, um, th there's some various um, ideas which are, are, are being propositioned. And this works for both large cities and small cities. So it covers the entirety of, of, of the work which our mayors are, are working on. So if we look at larger cities, you know, it's known that they're going to have higher outputs. They're going to have a more diversified local economy. And there's going to be both uh, positives and negatives in attractiveness of new business and investment. One of the downsides, of course, of the large cities is limited space. And, and there's a trade-off then of how you utilize space, what's available, or how you reclaim space. Uh, and the final thing about the large cities we're finding in ASEAN itself that a lot of these larger cities are investment ready when compared to the smaller secondary cities. So if we look at the small cities, what we see, we usually have a low output, a very, very narrow economy. So some cities are just uh, based upon one single sort of economic driver or two. Um, the attractiveness of small cities we see as on the very positive side because of land availability, land costs, uh, and also lifestyles. Um, so in that view, we see the expandability of small cities has been very, very um, important into, into the creation of this uh, productive agglomerations. And the problem we do find with small cities is they do have investment issues. 
and how they can attract investment and how they can get credit worthy um, to, to really secure investment. Um, the three policy areas we, we look at are, are what we call talent pools, uh, the agglomerate itself uh, and the productive base. And we'll just move on to the next slide and then just look at the, the policy frameworks, which, which are not definitive, but they, they're fairly close to, to what we're aiming for. So in talent pools, we, we're talking about human capital. And as we know, you, you can create the environment in a city to attract and retain high level, high talented people and individuals. Uh, and this means really focusing city development and investment around facilities, around connectivity. Lifestyles play a very important role. I mean, I'm lucky to be in Bangkok and, and pre-COVID, it, it was a real buzz of a hub, which was attracting a lot of talent, young talent. Um, and, and when we compare, say for example, uh, one of the cities in Laos next door, uh, the capital, you know, it, it's a different sort of lifestyle, um, um, feature there, which perhaps doesn't attract the, the talent which required for this agglomeration. Uh, the other issues in there, of course, is to ensure safety. I mean, talented people, talented individuals look for safety. And, and it is really about the future investments. So attention, uh, attraction and retention of talent pools is a very critical policy uh, area to work on. Uh, the other areas is, is when we talk about agglomerates and a lot of cities do have a known enterprise within that. And really, policy should aim to, to, to have build-offs. Uh, and these can link directly to um, our previous speaker, where the build-offs can improve environments, for example. Um, there's also a trade-off on that as well. So, so that needs to be clearly understood. Um, it's also very important that policymakers, planners, and um, the um, economic departments of cities really start to explore critical sectors where growth can be uh, induced in a city. Uh, and always bear in mind that a city becomes itself uh, an export destination. It becomes a, a place of export as well. And there's an international nationality uh, which should be promoted within cities. Um, and, and this also includes the, the issue of cultural uh, diversification. So the, so the more the cities become sort of cosmopolitan, to use an old phrase, then um, the likely of you'll get the agglomeration into, um, into a greater growth rate. Uh, and finally, um, we, we start to look at the productive base and the productive basin um, of cities. And again, this is under the jurisdiction of mayors, uh, where, where you should be refraining from putting all your eggs into a single basket. So diversification of, um, of agglomeration is required, of, of industry, of, of work, of services. So don't go down the road of a monoactivity sort of urban centre, uh, which has been one of the drawbacks we found uh, in Europe. And also in Eastern Europe, a lot of monoactivity urban centres were, were, were developed. This survived 10 years or 20 years, but then they basically declined um, economically and socially. Um, there's a need also to continually upgrade policy, continue upgrade infrastructure. Um, access to education, higher education, learning, knowledge sharing becomes very, very important as a policy of, of, of the urban governments and the municipalities. Competitiveness is also needs to be retained and maintained. Uh, we see this in Asia a lot, where you're seeing a lot of countries losing competitors and also a lot of cities. Uh, this becomes a very, very important feature. And finally, um, in our ASEAN projects, we're using clean, smart technologies really to drive a new agglomeration model. And, and by having these technologies into place, the, these are the things which create talent pools. So it's all interlinked in a policy framework. It, it's, it's not exhaustive, but this is a basis of, of, of our methodology we're deploying. Next slide, please. And finally, I think the most important thing is when we start to talk about agglomerations uh, and city agglomerations, 
and, uh, and city development. And, and remember, when we talk about agglomeration a lot in, a, in the ASEAN cities, we talk about bringing the peri-urban areas into the metropolitan area. Um, but we have to build safeguards into this. And, and we are promoting the SDGs and really focus on policy safeguards around people, planet and prosperity. And it, it is about having equitable, inclusive agglomeration. Uh, on the planet that it's got to be environmental. You, you can promote greenness. And, you know, you've got to consider future natural resource shocks as well. Uh, and the prosperity is, if, if we start to really pull the urban areas into a metropolitan sort of unit, the peri-urban areas or, 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 or the non-official establishments, then, then we have to take a whole society approach. Um, we have to start to figure about how to share revenues amongst all um, inhabitants of the city and groups of the city. Uh, and critical to all this, of course, is services and how you um, really expand your service provision, uh, which can only be done, of course, through, I think, public-private investments now because of the limitations of the sector budgets. So, so in essence, that, that completes my presentation. Uh, we look forward to working with the mayors on the call under the ASEAN Cities project. Um, and please do reach out if, if you want any further information on, on what's just presented. But please, you know, have your economics departments and your planning units to start to interrogate the large amount of literature out there uh, related, especially to the European Union. And a very good site would be uh, the EIB, the European Investment Bank. Um, which really can share the experience of, of, of agglomeration, which has occurred in Europe uh, and which is happening now uh, within the ASEAN region. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Al, for that sharing about agglomeration. And thank you very much, Nati. All right, so uh, we'll have um, discussion uh, among the mayors and of course the faculty and uh, our esteemed resource speakers are here uh, and also our facilitators and partners. So uh, our discussion will be guided by three basic questions. So let me share this slide. Okay. So um, we had four speakers. We have uh, five speakers, uh, including Dr. Edgar, that provides the uh, context about smart city. We've hear, heard about, uh, from uh, private sectors and uh, civil society in terms of how they help the government uh, implement smart cities initiative. And then we, we heard Paul and uh, Matthew sharing uh, the projects and the things that uh, you and could partner with the LGUs in terms of uh, your smart cities initiative. So three basic questions and uh, I'll ask the help of course of Dr. Ann to moderate this discussion. So three questions. One, um, earlier you presented your current and proposed future initiatives. What will you do differently? Uh, given the sharing of our faculty and our development partners. And then second and third are, what agency or resources would you like to tap to pursue your Smart Cities Initiative? Um, I think uh, Matthew and Paul's uh, discussion and uh, Janat and um, um, Colin as well shared uh, the areas in which the LGUs could uh, you know, maximize as well or tap. And how could we maximize the APMA network to strengthen your smart city initiatives okay so all right so with that um dr ann go ahead please thank you very much dr jennifer um i'm gonna reshare the same screen i think actually instead of going directly to the miro board beginning with the um slide that dr jennifer just had up you want me to share it then? Yeah, actually, that would be great if you wouldn't mind. The question of what one would do differently, I think it's a wonderful starting place that um, everybody has identified initiatives that they have underway. And as you're thinking about things that you have done or would like to do, we've heard of a lot of really uh, instructive and, and even provocative uses of, of technology in, in different, um, different cities and, and different initiatives that ESCAP and ASEAN and other partners are, are spearheading. And so I'm curious if any of our mayors um, 
have thoughts about the way that data can be used or, or um, things that you might have underway. We are putting you on the spot, admittedly. For um, Mayor Hamid today about the project on Cyber Giant. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> for Cyber Jaya, for differently, actually, uh, we try to become as a cashless city. That means uh, all the business, all the transaction do online. Here, all the services, um, your uh, communication with, with the community as well will be uh, mostly online. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we, uh, we try because now uh, for the PT traders also, uh, we use, uh, you know, we use a uh, uh, cashless. I mean, uh, PT traders or night market also try to promote. They can uh, pay the, the bill or they will wish the, you know. Wonderful. So Honorable Mayor, as you are looking at using that technology um, to further your, your initiatives and, and to, in fact, um, focus the, the, the use of resources, I'm wondering also uh, amongst all of the mayors um, if, if there are thoughts about the use of data to gain investment. I mean, I heard that from a couple of our speakers that um, by gathering more environmental data or having um, more and, and deeper and more consistent data that we can not only deliver services more effectively, but that we might be able to um, solicit and elicit the kinds of investment that help to um, resource and capitalize these projects. And so I'm wondering if anybody is using data to um, to help kind of document the return on investment or to predict return on investment, or um, if that is an area that uh, we might want to learn more about. Okay, going to that, uh, now we try to be uh, equipped with uh, Wi-Fi wi or with a good uh, connect connectivity. So we uh, give the approval to the telecommunication company to provide more facilities to, to provide. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you. Wi-Fi, yes. Thank you. And, And so, for instance, in providing each of these services, whether it's free Wi-Fi or um, different forms of energy, so um, solar energy or um, improving waste processing, each time we're, we're using technology to provide the services, we are potentially also gathering investment that enables us to um, justify that the the resourcing and, and the efforts in these directions. Um, and so I'm wondering, for instance, um, Mayor Chandpur, when we, when we think about the work that you're doing in, in Bangladesh and the, the introduction of um, alternative energy systems and auto waste process system and thinking of your side of, of things that you're planning to do in the future. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, if you don't mind, and, and ask you perhaps if there are opportunities to, um, to move in that direction by gathering the kind of data that, that shows the impact that you, might, that you might be able to have. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know that Chanpur is uh, climately most 
live vulnerable city and uh, it's uh, becoming temperature is getting hot and hot uh, so alternative energy is our next uh, is our plan uh, we are trying to move on uh, uh, initiatives uh, like uh, we are planning to uh, establish uh, solar light uh, streets and uh, solar lights uh, all over my city and so we are trying to using the uh, solar energy uh, to convert power so that uh, uh, we can use it and it would be helpful for us uh, due to uh, uh, climate changes so alternative energy system is uh, our next uh, our plan Excellent. Thank you. And I'll turn back to um, to waste uh, to waste to fertilizer project, and uh, we are planning to establish a plant in our existing uh, waste dumping square, dumping uh, places. Thank you very. Thank you, my Honorable Mayor. Um, that is exactly the, the question that we were posing. I appreciate it. Um, Paul, Paul Martin, I see your hand up. Is there, are there further thoughts that you can share with us? Yeah, uh, uh, oh, if I may, may and just, just to come in on one point mm -hmm. about data. Um, uh, uh, this is really a request to the mayors as well for consideration. Um, one of the, the features we're seeing in, in, in the cities is a lack of what we call credit worthiness, um, usually associated with um, the lack of a rating. Uh, they, they don't carry ratings, um, credit ratings from the agencies, of course. And this is a really big impediment for financing and investments. Um, so in terms of data, I, I think that the, the, the more explicit um, the, the mayors can be in, in data collection and data presentation, uh, would be more advantageous for city investments. And um, if we look at um, ensuring that the data which is being provided aligns to and matches in similarity the data requirements from the credit rating agencies, then perhaps this would answer the question of what we need. And typically a rating agency looks at the economic strength um, we, which is a sort of the, 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 the macroeconomics of the city. They look at the strength of the institutions themselves. Uh, uh, so that, that's become a self-regulatory thing. I mean, are, are, are transparent data for being provided, um, so such budget data, uh, and also physical strength, i.e. what's on the balance sheets of the cities themselves. Uh, and there's also a very interesting area, which I think, brings in the work of ESCAP, uh, my previous uh, colleague, uh, presenting colleague, uh, was about uh, event risk management, i.e. .e. risks from natural disasters or air pollutions. So I, th I think there's a, a requirement for data alignment uh, to what's required by investors. And that, I think we should be very specific on that um, area. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'm so appreciative of having that highlighted because um, especially in cities and, and all cities, of course, are under pressure to um, be very uh, thoughtful and intentional with their resources. But when resources are limited and we're making these investments, it's, it's, it's wonderful when we can organize a collection of data to further the sustainability from a financial standpoint of, of continued investment and um, uh, to make it um, pay for itself. And so thinking about the metrics that matter to folks who are able to help create the public private partnerships and the capitalized projects seems really quite important. I, I'm, I'm really appreciative. Um, other thoughts perhaps about the, the air pollution um, potential that Matthew Perkins was, was presenting and the, the opportunity to gather data that again, in that case, could um, provide the kinds of resources to further investment in ways that might sustain itself um, and, and kind of target and justify 
particular kinds of interventions. Mayor Hamid uh, was about to say something a while ago. Mayor, would you like to continue? Thank you. Mayor Hamid Hussein. Yes. Uh, you were about to say something a while ago. Um, would you like to pursue that? Thank you. Actually, uh, in my area for the a pollution not a big issue only uh, when uh, uh, you know when uh, problem is uh, uh, when uh, fire or burning Ill illegal dumping and then they burn the, the you know that that one of the the problem we have lah. for the industry we don't have a in that a big industry here at our area I issue on illegal illegal dumping. Illegal dumping. Thank you, Honorable Mayor. Are there opportunities to um, either so now, dis disincentivize or to um, to better track and 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 gather data about the the problem of illegal dumping? Yeah, yeah. Now, now uh, we we are, we have the data about 30, 30 area. Always they do the dumping, and then uh, we do the enforcement together with the other department, related department. And then the second issue is about the water, water. About uh, because uh, the sub water from our area, we also, as a main supply to the you know water issue. <clears throat> when uh, also about the 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 the, the dust, uh, you know the uh, pollution and pollution, but but not very very you know very 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 small pollution here lah. Thank you. And in the documentation, whether it is of illegal dumping or the pollution of water or, or air pollution, yeah, yeah. are there opportunities there also for public awareness and education? That was something that was identified in yeah, the this, slides that were returned in terms of, yeah, please. So, so the, the mean uh, we want uh, people uh, not, not uh, you know, uh, dump their, their waste or their, their oil from their, their, their shop or their industry to the river or to the dump site. So having the evidence base to share that out more broadly. I liked the phrase, um, thank you very much, Paul Martin, the okay. um, data collection and data presentation that when we present data in certain ways, it becomes more legible and, and usable to different constituencies, whether they're credit rating agencies, but sometimes residents and, and uh, members of the public. Well, yeah, that was really um, complete and 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 um, I think thorough set of responses to the first question. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer, for scribing and and enumerating those on that slide. And then, as we think, and I think we've touched on some of these already, but the opportunities, perhaps, that we are identifying and sharing amongst amongst ourselves um, or some other idea. Ideas or, or awareness that you might have of agencies or resources that you would like to tap to pursue your smart city initiatives, the things that, that you as mayors have identified. Are, are there um, ideas that have been sparked or, or um, um, intentions in that direction? Actually, for, for Sepang, we work closely with the telecommunication company agency resources, right? Working with a telecommunication company, uh, company, and also from the state government agency uh, to uh, provide <coughs> uh, connect connection connectivity 
and the system. For example, uh, for the park, smart parking, as uh, what I briefed uh, this morning, uh, we are collaborating with a uh, 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 company, a uh, parking company, uh, operator, operator parking, and uh, also with the state government agencies. Excellent. Um, and so when we hear also from Colin Steely and um, from Smart Cities Council and, and Janat Makbul, are there are there opportunities there to think about resources that were were identified either by Stratcon or, or by Smart Cities Council? Actually, from uh, our state state government, actually from uh, Selangor state government, because we are under the state government, state government already have a, a, a smart city council actually. So we work together with that uh, state government. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. And then also at our uh, city, we have also uh, smart uh, smart community uh, smart uh, committee uh, together with all the related department and also the company with uh, together with uh, at Cyber Jaya. Honorable Mayor, I think we're gonna, I'm going to want to ask you more about that in our next session on inclusion. That sounds wonderful. Can you tell us more about okay. the smart, smart Committee? Uh, smart Salango Committee, that means uh, last time uh, we call uh, Local Agenda. Now, now we already uh, Smart Salango Committee, that means... Uh, oh. That what we discussed about the smart city. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. I, I yeah. think that um, as we were hearing also the the, the value of co-creation and, and the importance of collaboration for implementation okay. outcomes. Um, thank you. Thank you. For thank you. Example. And Honorable Mayor Chanpur, is that something that you all are doing in, in Bangladesh as well? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and I know that in many cases, everybody has identified the, the importance of finding the funding and the resources to pursue the initiatives that are aspirations and goals. And so um, are there specific specific funders or, or private partners that that we want to be identifying and thinking about for, for implementing these these initiatives and for municipality is uh, facing a funding uh, crisis uh, to initiate the uh, our future projects uh, we already stated in our presentation uh, so a fund crisis is an issue for us, uh, especially uh, I have missed a point earlier that uh, Chanpur is, uh, is situated at the bank of three rivers. Uh, so what you were talking about pollution, uh, my re water, river water uh, pollution is also a concern for Chanpur municipality. Uh, because we three rivers, we situated at the bank of three rivers. Uh, two of them are the most biggest uh, river in Bangladesh, Podda and Meghna. Uh, so uh, our um, so most of the outlet of our drainage systems uh, falls in the river. Uh, so uh, it's it's polluting uh, every day, and this surface water. Uh, level is a source of uh, uh, our. It's a source, so we cannot pollute it. 
uh, something should taken uh, to reduce the pollution, uh, to stop um, that uh, uh, stop pollution. Something should be taken. So we didn't focus in our uh, slides uh, about pollution, uh, but I think as I have uh, seen that uh, our presentation uh, uh, from an expert was given regarding pollution. So I think uh, these, uh, they can help us uh, regarding these issues. Uh, it's, uh, besides, besides this, uh, uh, we are uh, planning to automate our whole system uh, and uh, UNCDF, uh, we have already grant uh, uh, $50,000 uh, from UNCDF in time of COVID-19 crisis. Uh, to to uh, mitigate the fiscal gaps, uh, to take initiatives. Uh, so, uh, but we are very grateful to UNCDF, but uh, it's uh, not enough to um, meet the goal to uh, implement the whole project. Uh, by by the way, uh, I think uh, funding is a crisis for us and. Uh, we are looking for, uh, we, we, we are planning to uh, fund a collaboration, a collaboration with municipal fund also. Uh, so uh, we, were, we need some help from the uh, donor agencies. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Mayor um, Chonpour. I, I, I very much appreciate you identifying water pollution and, and agricultural challenges as equally pressing um, areas and that, that really do require collaboration and networking. Thank you for identifying that and, and calling it out. Um, Honorable Mayor Ismail from Fuvamula City. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, just on the agencies and resources, I thought it would be good to have a strong uh, startup ecosystem, IT, because a lot of new ideas for smart cities come from these startups. So I think if we have a strong uh, culture for encouraging IT incubators and IT startups, I think it will greatly contribute to this smart city uh, plans. Wonderful, thank you, that, very important. Um, the innovation that comes from small small companies and the innovation of um, the, the startup culture and the willingness to take risks and, and, and move in new directions. Also really, really important and, and great to have on our list. Um, Paul Martin and then Matthew Perkins, I see hands up. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I mean, just very quickly, um, I, I think it would be very opportune now just to uh, inform the mayors that uh, UNCDF um, and UCLG um, have partnered um, and are launching in April of this April, I think it's April the 13th, a large scale um, a financing facility for, for cities, uh, which is called the International Municipal Investment Fund. Um, it, the, the investment fund itself um, is managed by Meridian out of Paris, which is one of the largest equity investors uh, in the world. Um, uh, and it, it's got a very high cap. Uh, and so we, you know, through ULC, uh, ULC, uh, UCLG, I'm sure that um, access to this finance can be provided. And I think it will address the issues which the mayor of Champor raised, where capital is required at volume uh, to address some of these emerging problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Matthew Perkins and then um, Honorable Mayor Ismael. Hi, thanks very much. Yeah, just a, a brief comment. Um, I, I note that uh, Chanpur is uh, in that uh, belt of uh, India that often struggles from, from very high levels of air pollution, particularly from, from open burning. Um, and, and in that regard to the, to the point on funding, I did want to clarify that both of the SCAP projects for city level action plans and the air pollution sensors are cost free for the beneficiary cities. All, all of the expenses are being borne by ESCAP there. 
Um, the in-kind contribution would just be in the, the time from the city officials to participate in the planning and organizational process, but those do come with resources. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the clear link to the sources of air pollution in all cities with the vehicular um, emissions, uh, it's certainly a very prevalent problem across, across all of our jurisdictions. So thank you very much. And um, Mayor, Honorable Mayor Ismail, I think your hand was up as well. I, I just want to return to the last point. Uh, you know, we are a small island in the middle of the Indian Ocean with the nearest uh, land mass 7,000 kilometers. And uh, last month we had a air pollution monitor installed, and it was interesting that the indicators are showing a much higher level of uh, pollution than we would have uh, assumed. So I think it will be interesting to work with like a Matthew's initiative to understand from where this is coming from, because we don't have much of burning, we don't have much uh, vehicles. It's just a five square kilometer island, so we have a lot of sea breeze as well. So I think uh, we are interested to work with Matthew's team to actually see uh, what the source of the pollution for us is. Thank you. Um, no, I, I know my hand is accidentally still up, but maybe I'll just uh, burst on. For, we would be very happy to work with you uh, to identify that and, and move forward if, if you're interested. Uh, I think maybe the organizers could facilitate. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Um, I think the one last question that we'll pose in the open conversation before I turn it over to Dr. Jennifer to summarize is um, the, the question of what, what additional um, role we can play in, in the mayor's network to facilitate your goals. And we've heard some things that, that Dr. Jennifer has, has written down, but I wonder if there's anything that we haven't mentioned or that hasn't been put forth that could be part of the, the resourcing or the network building that we're doing through the mayor's academy. And certainly we hope that's an ongoing conversation and an opportunity to, um, to provide feedback and, and to continue thinking about even between this module and the one that will convene in, in two weeks, the, the second part of this module. So Dr. Jennifer, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ann. And thank you very much for the engagement of our mayors and also our partners uh, to Paul and Matthew. So uh, we've seen now that uh, we could really harness the Asia Pacific Mayors Academy uh, in terms of linking our mayors to existing uh, projects because uh, as we know, most of the limitations of the mayor is really in terms of funding resources, whether it's uh, fiscal, whether it's human resource or uh, infrastructure as well. And we see here that uh, our partners from UN, SCAP, our partners from uh, UCLG, our partners from UNCDF, uh, our partners from ICLE, uh, and also APE APRU uh, have these programs that could really help our mayors. Um, most of it uh, really is just a collaboration, a cost, um, uh, doesn't cost uh, the, the mayors. Uh, so we hope that we could harness this partnership in terms of the Asia Pacific. Uh, Mayor's Academy. So I just quickly um, quickly browse through the presentations. Um, today, uh, we started with a discussion about um, smart cities, and we know that usually smart cities is usually equated with the technology. But as Dr. Edgars mentioned, it goes beyond digitalization, it goes beyond technology, which Janat mentioned. No? We need to know the why. We need to emphasize who we need to bring in the smart city initiative. And what are the impacts? Basically, uh, having our cities more livable, workable, and sustainable. And then uh, she also emphasized the incentive and the role of uh, data leadership in terms of using this big data uh, for something that would make our cities livable, workable, and sustainable. And then uh, Collins also mentioned some specific projects in terms of smart power metering in which we could engage the powers uh, the private sectors in terms of private-public partnership. 
And then uh, Matthew emphasized uh, having, uh, we need to also look into shared commons, uh, shared benefits in implementing smart city technology, especially in addressing air pollution, water pollution. Most of us here are really connected in terms of our location in the world, in terms of our geography. And uh, the right tools for the right job is really critical. And uh, Matthew mentioned two specific projects that UNSCAP could really work with the mayor, uh, very specific. So we'll, uh, I think one good thing, uh, Dr. Ann, is we have this, uh, uh, maybe an Excel uh, of the projects that our partners, our research speakers have shared, and then the contact details that we could also share with our honorable names. And then uh, Paul mentioned about agglomeration, about uh, merging the historic, mo modern, and smart, no? and uh, looking at the talent pools, agglomeration, and the productive base in order to pursue uh, the quality of people, the, the well-being of the planet, as well as ensure prosperity among all our constituents. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for this engagement. Uh, I'll call on uh, Dr. Anne as well to initially provide an overview of uh, Module 5. So thank you very much to our esteemed speaker, to our facilitators and partners from Play, from UNSCAP, of course, from uh, UCLG, who's here, um, and also from IHS and UAU. So Dr. Anne. Thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer. And I just want to acknowledge Jennifer Amparo's leadership in developing this module and sustaining it through the absence of our colleague, Motion Mohamed Zara, who's not able to be with us this evening. This content was really developed, um, the three of us together. And I'm, I'm just so pleased and honored to have um, Dr. Jennifer's leadership as we continue on and, and build it out in different ways. Um, the module that we'll move to next time in two weeks time, I'm gonna share my screen to um, share with you some of the, um, you know who I am, um, the learning objectives that we will turn to as we move to thinking about inclusion specifically and the inclusive part of smart cities. Um, we have talked a lot tonight and it was really wonderful to have Janat Makbul's uh, presentation of smart and thinking about um, the smartness as, as well as, as, um, as Dr. Reyes's uh, presentation at the outset to think about all of the different permutations of being smart and using data in, in intelligent and thoughtful and intentional ways, it is equally important that we put our values of sustainability at the fore and to think about um, really building equity and inclusion into the uses of data and providing more and different opportunities for all of the residents across jurisdictions both for this long-term environmental and economic sustainability of your cities, but also for their stability and, and for the, um, the overall um, stability of, of regions. So we will talk next time in two weeks time about different sectors of activity and patterns of exclusion that we see across cities and in specific cities. We will ask you to think about the drivers that either support and, and, and enable engagement or in fact limit it and make it, make it more difficult than, than we would like it to be. We'll talk about the mechanisms that can potentially promote inclusion. And then we'll introduce the idea of co-production, building on these ideas of co-creation and collaboration so that the initiatives that we develop and work to implement have the highest possible chance of success and make the best use of your time and energy and resources and really accrue benefit to your constituents and your residents. In service of that, the homework that we will send you the Miro board link for and, and a reminder of the assignment on is we have two questions for you that we would like to use to generate the, the thought and engagement with our session in two weeks time. The first is the, the specific drivers that are promoting or inhibiting engagement in, in your smart city initiatives. So having identified some of the things that you are currently doing or would like to do, or maybe now after hearing from our partners and the resources and opportunities that they have brought forth, um, how might those, those um, initiatives what are the drivers behind them that can promote or inhibit engagement? So we'll ask you to answer that question and, and um, use the sticky notes and build out the worksheets on Miro so that we can engage together on that board. And then what are some ways to promote social inclusion outcomes in, in those initiatives? 
And so we will send those specific prompts to you as well as links to the worksheet for our next session. And we would ask that you please try to return the responses by the 18th so that we can organize them and use them to, to support our, um, our engagement together at that time. The, the way that we'll open and in two weeks time is, is thinking about the Smart Cities uh, Connect initiative and, and private sector initiatives across a number of different firms globally to build the, um, the mesh, the net, the internet of things that is enabling more and different ways of connecting. Um, we will also talk very specifically about the, the ethics of big data and, and the importance uh, both from an inclusion and, and equity standpoint of building eth ethical protections into our smart city initiatives, but also importantly, in terms of building your business climate and, and for the very reasons that we've started to talk about tonight around credit worthiness and, and the desirability for investors, we know increasingly that um, taking, taking privacy and, and um, the, the overall climate seriously from, from an ethical standpoint is actually one of the things that is increasingly important to many investors. So um, those topics are, are coming. And um, I think that that's probably a good place to stop this evening. Um, it has been wonderful to have your direct engagement. I know we've been a small group this evening, but I can say personally, I'm, I'm really, really encouraged and inspired by some of the initiatives that we've heard from our partners this evening, including, and especially our partners from ESCAP and ASEAN. And thank you so much for pointing out the, the um, initiatives that you're offering and, and the fact that they are at no cost and, and really promising to push forward the, um, the very needed investments across all cities in, across the Asia and Pacific region. So thank you very much. Very much, Dr. Ang. Uh, before we leave, could we request for a group photo? Unfortunately, some of our colleagues have already left, but we'd like to request uh, if you could open your videos, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, to our colleagues based in the States, so it's already, <laughs> what time is it there? So, okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It's such a pleasure to join you. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Our honorable mayors. Uh, Matthew, your video mm -hmm. was on itself. All right. All right. All right. Just a moment. Okay. One, two, five. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Have a good afternoon or good morning. Thank you, Sam, for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Honorable.